for live mayor. Recording in progress. Through Zoom or by telephone. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Nixon? Here. Councilmember Black? Here. Councilmember Curtis? Here. Councilmember Falcone? Here. Councilmember Pascal? Here. Deputy Mayor Arnold? Here. Mayor Sweet? Here. Here. Thank you. Our study session tonight is for a Parks Funding Exploratory Committee Facility Feasibility <clears throat> Study Update. We expect to reconvene our regular meeting at approximately 7.30. City Manager. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a very exciting presentation. We have the whole study session set aside for it <clears throat> um, tonight. We're going to be walking you through the same presentation that was given to PFEC about the two aquatic and recreation facility options at Houghton Park and Ride and at the North Kirkland Community Center. We're not looking for decisions tonight. PFEC hasn't made any final recommendations. Those will come to the council at the end of March. But what we are looking for is thoughts, feedback, insights, or any comments that you want to share with our talented team that we have here, both staff and consultants. So um, I'm going to go ahead and let Lynn Zwagstra, our Parks Director, introduce everybody, and we're looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Oops. Don't think that is on. I don't think you are on, Lynn. Hold, please. I can't even see that switch over there. <laughs> We're super happy to be here with you this evening. Um, as Kurt mentioned, we're presenting the Recreation and Aquatic Center Feasibility Study Results. That is the brunt of our presentation this evening, although we will end with uh, just a little tidbit on where PFEC is at. Um, but first, let me introduce our team. Uh, the city's project lead for this project is Mary Gardaki, our Park Planning and Development Manager, and also our uh, Management Analyst for the Ballot Measure, Hillary De La Cruz. And our consultants for the project would be Jim Calvillage from Opsis. Oh, he's on this side. Yeah. And Chris Roberts with Opsis as well. We have Darren Barr with Ballard King over here and George Dynas with Councilman Hunsaker over here. And uh, in, uh, in the peanut gallery, kidding, um, behind them providing support would be Jason Filan and John Lloyd. Uh, we have 72 slides for you this evening. Uh, we are hoping to take no more than 45 minutes so that there's plenty of time for question and answer. This is the one time that we'll have all the consultants in front of you regarding the feasibility study. So definitely ask them any, any questions that you have. So first we'll go through that piece of um, the presentation and then we'll do the quick PFEC update at which point in time we'll uh, turn it over for a Q&A. So on that note, I will introduce Mary Gardaki while I pull up the presentation. Oops, I forgot. Oops. I was going to see if you actually had the hard copies of these we as do. well. Um, okay, great. All right, so uh, tonight, as uh, Kurt mentioned, we are going to replicate as much as we can of the presentation we gave to PFAC. So this is the presentation that we shared with them. Um, and this was the uh, meeting agenda for that evening. We just did quick inter introductions and agenda overview just now with Lynn. And then I'm gonna cover the city direction to the planning team. And then that point on, it'll be covered by OPSIS. So as a recap, uh, this is basically a recap of our premise of our work with OPSIS. And basically, we asked the, them to look at our existing inventory and conditions of our community center and facilities. And as you can see, we basically have 22,000 square feet for a community of our size. Um, and the, they are Peter Kirk Community Center at 9,800, North Kirkland at approximately 12,000, and then the outdoor seasonal pool at, uh, at Peter Kirk. The RFP then asks for uh, an evaluation of four sites in total, and the criteria of that is b three basic criteria. Is it city owned or soon to be owned by the city? Its proximity and location in the city, is it north or south? Is there opportunity for complementary support? 
and then of course access to public trans transportation. So with that, we incorporated Peter Kirk Community Center and North Kirkland, but added the two sites, Houghton Park and Ride and Juanita Beach Park North. OPSIS then took that information, they came up, um, they did a lot of analysis, a lot of evaluation, looking at soil conditions, site constraints, permitting. Um, we're able to evaluate all of these sites and come up actually with some scores and, and also some test fit diagrams um, based on that information. And we shared that information with PFAC in October and then we also did some on-site polling quickly on what they thought of those options. We learned a lot from that process, and in fact, we learned that um, one, we, there is a strong affinity to keeping the Houghton Park and Ride in North Kirkland, but we also learned that Peter Kirk was going to require a little bit more extensive community engagement. As you know, Peter Kirk Park is near and dear to a lot of folks' hearts, and it's not simply about where we could fit an aquatic center. It's an opportunity for us to look at that park in total in a more meaningful and extensive community process, which would take a lot more time. And then simply by the evaluation and the scoring site concerns, we removed Juanita Beach. And we got council support for that decision. So then we were looking, focusing only on the two sites, Houghton Park and Ride in North Kirkland. And what you see here is a quick, iconic representation of what OPSIS will be going through the details of each of these sites. So for Houghton Park and Ride, you have option A and B. Um, one is larger than the other, so option A is actually a three-story facility with a structured parking option, and then option B is a smaller facility with all surface parking. North Kirkland, option A is a larger facility with an aquatic component. Option B, now you're gonna see a B1 and a variant B2, not talking COVID, but it's really just the design of option A has the aquatic, it's larger facility with an aquatic component. Then option B1 is a smaller facility, no aquatic, and B2 takes out the gymnasium and puts in an aquatic component. So it's a little variant of B, B1. So uh, OPSIS is going to walk you through all the details of what they've come up with for these options, and they're gonna start off with the facility guiding principles. So I'm going to turn it over to OPSIS. Jim or Chris? Is, I'll take this one. Which was the magic button? This is holding it. Down. Down, okay. There you go. Thank you, Mary. Um, I wanted to start off with one of the guiding principles for the project, and they were really born out of the PROS plan and then further developed and refined with workshopping and the park, st park staff. Um, uh, as, as we were starting up the project. And, and the, the guiding principles really um, lay the groundwork of all the, uh, the philosophies behind the decision making along the way. Um, I think we were charged, or, or we were looking really at trying to create facilities and programs that were welcoming, safe, and accessible. We wanted to have the right size facilities. That's why you'll see a multiple facility sizes at, at the various locations tonight and really try to create a, a, the ability to maximize their use throughout uh, the city of Kirkland. And then we were also really concerned or, or focused on um, uh, addressing how these facilities could, could be um, maximize the sustainability efforts within, within the community. Um, and so some of that has to do with the solar orientation of the buildings. You'll see some roof forms tonight that begin to talk about how uh, power generation could be t handled with, within the buildings themselves. Um, and so basically an overall uh, effort to try to support sustainable practices within the city of Redmond. I mean, excuse me, Kirkland, sorry, <laughs> apologies. Um, and then um, uh, financially, you know, realizing that, that this is a real investment that the city is, is making on, on behalf of, it, of its citizens. And, and so trying to optimize the value of, of the budgets that we're, we're looking at for the various programs. Um, and, um, you know, in the end, try to come to a, a level where we're pre presenting the pertinent information for y'all to make decisions that will be, lead to a successful ballot measure in, in the future. And so those are really kind of what's guiding the information that you'll be seeing here tonight. So with that, I'm gonna pass off to Jim and, and, Darren. and Darren, excuse me, Darren. We're, we're very well rehearsed here. <laughs> 
So again, it's important that when we go ahead and look at this, we're talking about the building blocks from the PROS plan. So um, what we heard through that plan and, and our interpretation of it, indoor aquatics and recreation, the most needed indoor aquatic center is rated first and indoor recreation center is rated third. In terms of indoor facilities, we'll increase participation. And when we asked about that, 36% of participants said recreation center or indoor aquatics would increase their participation in programming. Uh, when we started talking about most important programs and services, again, this is coming out of the, the PROS plan, special events, environmental and outdoor programs, fitness, aquatics, health and wellness, sports. Uh, when we talked about needs that weren't being met, adaptive and special needs, culturally specific, environmental and outdoor, after school and camp, special interest and in education programs, and then talking about the swim lesson need. And this is summer of 2022 data from the city. 2,800 swim lesson slots, which equated to 1,400 unique participants, um, 10,850 swim lesson waitlist entries, which is about 1,500, 1,475 unique individuals. So right now you're hitting about 56% of what you can do. So the equals is when you start looking at these two slides is that an indoor recreation facility with aquatics uh, bego begins to address those needs that were identified in the PROS plan. Um, we did a comprehensive market analysis for this pro project. It's important that we, that we base our operations and our facility recommendations on that. Um, the community needs and population can support multiple indoor and aquatics facilities. Uh, that's based on uh, our experience doing these types of projects. It's also based on some NRPA standards that we looked at. Uh, our opinion was that the facility should vary in size and program focus, so it shouldn't be just a one-size-fits-all. Um, all the facilities should include a fitness element, and that sometimes people get nervous about that, but a lot of it depends upon what type of equipment is included, what type of programming it caters to. Um, there needs to be a continued focus on older adults and associated programs, um, really, and then that leads us into the idea of multi-generational, multicultural programming. Pretty much everywhere we're going, we're seeing more and more seniors stay active longer. They're drifting away from senior centers or drifting towards community centers and recreation facilities. So um, the demographics and what we saw here played out with that as well. When we talked about uh, the proposed locations at the Houghton Park and Ride, obviously it's a new location. New services would be introduced here. Um, new to the city, so membership-based fitness model, indoor aquatics, gymnasium, indoor walking. Um, it also allows server expansion of services, right? Enrichment programming, senior programming, aquatics programming, which you're going ahead and maxing out during the summer. Uh, North Kirkland goes ahead and does many of the same things. It's an existing location, but now you're talking about a purpose-built facility as opposed to an adapted facility, and it goes ahead and allows you new and expanded services similar to what Houghton Park and Ride is at. Jim or Chris is going to talk. Jim's going to talk a little bit. Um, so we wanted to just share a little bit the relationship between program and the types of activity spaces that would be supported by those spaces. And they're really grouped into two categories of recreation and community uses. Um, starting with a, a recreation uh, pool, what it can support is a variety of activities uh, from water play with children and teens uh, for older population, uh, aerobic exercise, even therapy, physical therapy. A lot of potential activities can be supported through a warm water pool. And as you can see too, uh, that body of water actually can accommodate a lot of people within uh, that area. Uh, and then there's a, a cooler temperature uh, pool, uh, a lap pool that has swimming lanes in it. Um, really great for exercise and lap swim. Uh, water walking um, really can support swim team practice, even uh, swim clubs, water polo, lifeguard training. A variety of activities can occur uh, within this type of body of water. They really complement each other, uh, and that's what uh, we're proposing uh, for, for Kirkland. And then... Um, uh, a multi-purpose gymnasium. We've heard a great need for this type of space. And as you're all aware, it can support a variety of court games, and including pickleball. You can uh, uh, line these courts to support a lot of that type of activity as well. It can be an indoor playground even 
if you include a, a walk jog track, which is also a high ranked element in a pros plan that easily can be integrated into the gym, as well as just special events that can occur in that space. And then a fitness room. This is uh, a very flexible room that can hold a variety of equipment um, from state, uh, uh, strength training to cardio workout, functional training. Um, it's oftentimes a, a place where people get familiar and learn about working with this equipment. And oftentimes, eventually, they join a health club. So it it's, uh, serves people who are uh, just learning and those who are more familiar with the equipment. It can also be used for physical therapy and uh, a number of other possible uses. Uh, then a multi-purpose exercise room. We're looking at a couple different sizes, one kind of being smaller, more for mind-body and yoga, Pilates types of activities, and then a larger one that could be used for uh, dance classes, uh, martial arts. Um, you can also, uh, a, a new trend too is just uh, gentle motion classes uh, where it really does serve uh, the senior population or those with mobility issues. Um, and then moving into the category of community spaces, probably one of the most important spaces would be a, a community room that could be subdivided. It could seat up to 200 or 300 people, depending how large it is. Uh, can also have a performance stage. That's something that uh, we're looking at as well. Um, so it can support those multicultural events. Oftentimes, too, and what we're looking at is that it would have a kitchen associated with it, which can also support uh, cooking classes and uh, cultural activities, um, performances, senior lunches, very flexible space. So uh, that's in the program as well. And then Kirkland's really known for you know your arts and, and the celebration of the variety of cultures that are here in, in Kirkland. And so uh, providing a variety of spaces from general purpose classrooms to uh, ancillary spaces, uh, teen and senior uh, spaces that can support your existing facilities that are in Peter Kirk Park. Uh, not uh, compete, but complement. Arts and crafts, even uh, music classes. Uh, there's active and passive gaming. And uh, creating a, a space, too, that could support multicultural activities as a resource room. Before we go to the next, just any questions on what you've seen so far, how all this gets integrated into the design comes next. But just want to check in. All right. Thank you. All right, well, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and start sharing some of the concepts and programs that we developed for Houghton Park and Ride. Um, and so taking all the gr groundwork and things you just saw that, that Jim was presenting, uh, we're going to go through the program after, after we uh, take a quick look at the site. I think you all are familiar with the Houghton Park and Ride site, newly purchased uh, a plot of land uh, off of uh, Northeast 70th Place and 116th Avenue Northeast. This is uh, just showing the, the general area that we we're looking at. It's, it's, it's what's outlined there in yellow. It's got the access just to and fro the, the 405 freeway uh, with uh, 70th, uh, northeast 70th place bisecting going in the east-west direction. So a lot of great traffic connections, hence the reason it's, it's a park and ride. So it makes getting to and from the site a real ideal place um, in, in terms of its location. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about just the programs that we're looking at for this site. Now, it's the larger of the, of the sites we were looking at, and so we're uh, looking at the larger program areas um, uh, within the study. Um, so option A uh, was looking at, hey, let's uh, look at a full-blown three-court gym, really maximize its usability, functionality, and operations um, uh, on, on the site. The larger gym also accommodates a larger walk-jog track. Um, we have a, a fitness room that's kind of sized at its optimal capacity, just from an operational s standpoint. Um, and then in, uh, two uh, varying sizes of multi-purpose rooms uh, that complement each other uh, for a, a multitude of, of activities within in the facility. 
Um, the aquatic space, we looked at the, the recreational water, indoor rec water. We've got about 6,200 square feet of that in this plan. So that includes all the, the activities that Jim was showing you in the previous slides. And then this has a, a full eight lane, 25-meter um, pool uh, uh, included in, in the aquatic section. Um, and then on the community space side, we're looking at our, our largest community uh, space room that we've, we've looked at in, in the study. So th we're saying it's 300 seats co comfortably, um, but it's, uh, that equates about 3,400 square feet. Um, and th that space could be subdivided into three separate rooms to, again, maximize the, the usability of, of programming within uh, uh, the, that area. The large uh, commercial catering kitchen that Jim was referring to that can serve a multiple uh, activities. Um, uh, the stage, which doubles as a classroom space, so you're getting kind of double duty for real performances uh, within the space, uh, but also utilizing it as classroom space when it's not being utilized as performance. Uh, multicultural center that greets you when you come in, a child watch area, arts and crafts studios, maker space, and then party and meeting rooms to, to accommodate people that are uh, uh, coming in and out of the building and want to uh, have, a, have a rentable space to, to gather family around. And so option that's option A. Uh, option B, really the difference is uh, there's a reduced down to two court gym instead of three court. That smaller footprint equates to a smaller walk-jog track as well. Um, instead of an eight-lane pool, we're looking at a six-lane pool. Uh, but we're also looking at, as that pool shrinks, the recreation water increases. So we're looking at about 8,000 uh, square feet. Of that. That's just the water only area. Um, and then really has just about all the same programs as the larger space. They're just a little bit smaller. For instance, the community event space seats 200. It's about 2,400 square feet. So it's, it's, it's just taking one of the bays out, um, just looking at another uh, option there. Um, it does have a game room in it, which d does not happen in, in, in the option A, so that's another um, uh, opportunity for uh, younger people uh, or, or older to want to play like pool, video games, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and uh, so that kind of is the general, and, and the sizes of the, of, the, of the facilities also generate where you see the parking stalls and how much parking is required, which leads me into our first Option A uh, at Houghton Park and Ride. Here we're looking at uh, 376 parking stalls with the building located kind of in the southeast corner of the site. Oh, and I'll also say um, we've tilted this drawing 90 degrees. So north on this drawing, where previously it was going up in the screen, now it's going off to your, your left here. Uh, we did that so you could see it more clearly. Uh, um, but uh, we've got a, a ramped parking platform, so we do need some additional parking here. And we've uh, the city has done an overlay uh, with uh, the proposed WashDOT future um, improvements here. So the idea would be uh, that um, easement or right of way kind of would cut in front of where the building is. So. In, in theory, our, we can massage the building footprint, and, 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 the, and those two concepts can live in, in uh, uh, peace with one another, if you will. Um, so, but take advantage of all, all the circulation as far as traffic to and fro, buses, everything really nicely situated. Uh, have your sort of main entry in, in, in the heart and center of, of, of the site. And then this show, this is a, a stacking diagram, so you can kind of visually see how the programs are organize, organized through the building. So the lower level being uh, sort of where you enter, or that's where your fitness areas are, administration, your pools on that lower level. You get to the second level, that's where your multi-purpose gym, you've got some of your uh, maker space, art rooms, uh, exercise rooms, and then on the third level, you've got your walk jog track and you've got your big community room space that has just fantastic views out to, to Lake Washington there. And so that's just kind of how the program's organized. This is more of a specific view at those plans. So you can see the recreation pool, the lap pool, the center of the building with the locker rooms and your aquatics operations. You've got your fitness room there off to the left or to the north, uh, which is a really great you know, visual cue and sees, so as you're coming into the building, 
uh, there by the lounge space. Uh, you can see a lot of activity. We've got multiple lounge spaces around in the plans you'll see, and that's to kind of have these moments of informal meeting and gathering and greeting and places to, to just uh, um, kind of liven up uh, and uh, the space and, and create a place for, for people just to, to meet. Uh, on the upper level, you can see the three-court gym. Again, that's a multi-purpose gym, so there's tons of activities. We're just kind of showing it basketball, but there are hundreds of activities that you can run, hundreds of ways to stripe this area. Um, you've got your arts and crafts studio, maker space, your multi-purpose rooms. Uh, that's where your yogas and your jazzercises, whatever. You can do so much stuff and activities there. All again, you're on the second level here, so you've got some pretty good views of Lake Washington. Then you've got fantastic views of Lake Washington from, from this uh, upper third level, where you've got the community room. Those dash lines indicate partition walls where you can divide it into three rooms or have one large gathering space. You've got the walk jog track. You can do your mile and nine laps here. And then a little rooftop terrace uh, where you can use it as just a a place for gathering, it could be a place for stretching, you could have like morning yoga there, there's a lot of just opportunities of, of ways you can treat that space. And this is just a visualization of what this might look like. Um, and so the idea of, of the, the entry plaza down in the, in, the, in the center of the site, you can begin to sort of see the little ramps uh, uh, parking off to the left there, it, it's tucked back into the site and begin to see its context and bringing that greenery around uh, by uh, treeing up the, the parking area and, and the perimeter. There's a, a back uh, courtyard area, nice gathering space, and then just the idea of these, these great views looking out, whether it be the corner of the gym, the walk jog track, the community room, just trying to be open and inviting. And then we're trying to take advantage, just as just a simple design, you know, it hasn't been fully worked out, but the concept is have these great north facing windows, bring natural daylighting in, reduce your energy usage. And then on the back side of that, that can be like photovoltaic panels where you're producing energy as well. So minimizing the use of energy within the building then actually producing energy on the building, which is one of our core tenants. Uh, um, of the project. Here is an entry view as, as you, you would be approaching. You see the activity down below and, and um, oh, and there's a night shot there. Same, same view, but kind of again, just to get the flavor of it. Then if I go to option two, uh, site plan. Just one second, just want to see if any questions on option one before we, there's a lot more slides on B too, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm going fast. I'm I just sorry. want to make sure they get a chance to check in if they have any questions. Thank you. I have a question just about the aquatic space between, it's actually a comparison between A and B. Um, it looks like the actual water area is the same between the two, around 11-ish thousand um, square feet. What is, uh, accounts for the other, like pretty big difference in the overall aquatic space? Is that like if you have like the eight lane that you have more like bleachers and things for competitive swimming for people. Yeah, there's more more circulation that? around the edges. So so when you see the those total numbers, the 23 and the 18, that's accounting for the circulation and deck area as well. And so that we try to pull the, those two out. Um, and so that's kind of the way they're fit. They they fit there. So when you see that differentiation in the totals, it's the deck area. There's more deck area for people to, to maneuver around in, in the larger option. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Pascal, and then Councilmember Nixon too. After, um, I was going to say my question, but it's about option A. Yes, you talked about the fact that because it's a larger size and it has more amenities, it needs um, a greater number of parking stalls. How much is that? Is the uh, providing additional parking contributing to the cost? Is that a pretty significant portion of the increased cost in option A, or is it? A small portion. Do you? I, I, to to yes. So the, the the more parking, particularly on option A, um, what we've tried to do is come up with. Oh, just go to the plan here so you can see it. Uh, so we're talking about the same thing. So you see that ramped platform right. platform there. So structured parking. Anytime where we can start getting into structured parking, uh, we're talking additional costs. Um, you know, we'd love to put everything surface parking uh, around there. Uh, the 376 and the size of our building is is requiring us to 
Pro we try to look at it kind of creatively and do a half and half where it's really just a ramp up and a ramp down to minimize the cost, but there's, ad there's, there's an added amount of cost as, as soon as you start building versus just having a, a, an asphalted surface parking lot. So uh, I think yes is the answer to your question. Yeah. It equates to the 76 uh, parking stalls too out of the 370. So it's a, a small area. Do you have an right. estimate for the, the ramp? A cost estimate for the ramp? For the ramp parking. Oh, the ramp parking alone? I'd, I'd have to I'd have to grab my estimate well, to take I a look. I want the question in my mind. I'll try to kind of state it. Is like, let's say that you were able to eliminate the need for increased parking between option A and option B, right? Does that bring the costs of both options closer together, almost, or is it are they still pretty far apart? No, the, well, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, if, if we are to eliminate the structure parking, then that would bring their costs much closer in alignment with one another. And I will say that we've done, that there's an initial parking study that's a part of our feasibility study um, that is sort of justifying these numbers. So when you see like 376, that's based on a, a parking stall count per thousand square feet of area we have and looking at historical data around for these types of facilities. Um, a, a, a full um, parking study would need to be completed as a part of the actual project to really dial in that number. So that number could potentially drop, it could go up. And so this is sort of a, a ballpark number that kind of gets us a pretty good gauge of where we're gonna be. Um, so in a perfect world that would drop <laughs> and we would not need to put the structured parking in here. But the, the, as soon as we get kicked that in, and we're close, we're, I mean, it's really close to where we can almost get that within uh, our parking requirements, but we'll, that'll need to be finalized. No, I understand. Thank you for that. But the, the primary cost difference has to do with the increased square footage of, of the larger option. So, Yeah, they, so the, the, the square footage itself does. I'm sorry if I misspoke yeah. or, or I misunderstood your question. Yeah. So, yeah, the, there is an equation. That, you know, they're, they're, the buildings themselves are basically costing the same amount per square foot, or, you know, generally. But... Okay. So it's, it's just the so the bigger, the more expensive it is. Um, but the, the, the parking structure is definitely a big ticket number yeah. uh, when we start doing structured parking. Councilor Nixon. Thanks. Well, you, you answered part of my question about it's just going to be one ramp down, yeah. not multiple levels below ground. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, but thinking along the same lines, um, would it be any problem to consider that to be a phase two that we could do later? Um, if it's completely independent from the main building, then mm -hmm. it seems like it could be a separate mm -hmm. project that we could fund mm -hmm. in the future. Um, <clears throat> although I do have one question about whether there, for example, is going to be an underground connection between the two so you could park under cover and then mm -hmm. go through a tunnel and get in the building without getting wet. Um, I'm not sure if that was considered or not. Yeah, Council Rexon, it's actually a ramp up. It's not a ramp down. It's an elevated ramp. Well, there is a, there is a ramp below. The ramp that goes is, down is from the north to the south. Right. Goes so underground. You've got, like you've got this story, kind right? of going on here. Uh, yeah, two yeah. parallel. And so conceivably, if you're one story below ground, you could have a tunnel that connected to the building, uh, and that would have to be a consideration in the, in the design, either a stairway or an elevator or something. Mm -hmm. But if we're not going to do that, and people are just going to have to figure out how to walk back up the ramp and then around the ramp all the way to the building, um, then it clearly would be a completely, it could be a completely separate project. It could be regardless. I mean, you would have stairs close to the building. So you come out of the garage, you don't have to walk back up the ramp. So there would be that convenient access. I think if you weren't building the parking structure, we'd have to bring the parking requirement down or you would need to reduce the amount of square footage in the building. There's a direct relationship, as Chris said, between the amount of parking and the square footage in the building. And, and I will say, um, you all be regulating yourself on this parking requirement. Um, and I think there's a real case to be made uh, for the um, enhanced um, multimodal traffic. I think that was part of our earlier analysis that we had done 
that, that one of the reasons this is a great site is because it is served by a lot of different uh, means of transportation. And that does evaluate, it's, it's balancing act, you know, how many parking spaces do you need? How many other ways can you get there, you know, bus, bike, however, might might skateboard if you're if you're that ilk. But and that actually was my next question. So you're doing great. <laughs> Anticipating. <laughs> and, and that is that the number of spaces uh, per square foot um, is determined by us. So if we wanted to waive it, we could waive it, right? Yeah, uh, that's 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 up to you. I will not tell you what to do. But <laughs> well, the, the city attorney could. Yes, tell you, the question but yes, but I think yes. That's true. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm too lighthearted. To waive it, we could, um, and, and so it just depends on how much confidence we have in the uh, projections of how many people will use transit or other other means to get here besides driving a car. Yes. Yeah, Council Minister. Council Member Nixon, you're totally correct on that. Um, the Kirkland Code actually allows uh, recre parks and recreation uh, facilities and amenities to be done on a case-by-case -case basis for parking. Um, so there is a little bit more flexibility for that. Thank you. I, I have a question. Are we incorporating bicycle facilities? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we've been looking at, at bicycle counts as well. I, we're not showing those here in our counts, but on in our report, that's one of the other items we're, we're looking at is is reports and or uh, having space for the bicycles. And then the other thing that always is kind of critical with that is, as you have here, are are the shower and locker facilities to accommodate that. So um, that, that's, that's one of the great things about, it's inherently in, within the properties of these types of buildings is they offer those, those types of amenities uh, to anyone in the community. Great. Um, Councilmember Falcon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, since we're talking about parking um, and you had mentioned um, that one of the potential benefits is really a lot of um, recreation and exercise for some of our older adults and others with mobility challenges. I just want to mention that I would love for us to look at um, going above the minimum requirements for disabled parking stalls at these facilities, <clears throat> just because we are um, targeting that population for, for using these facilities. Thank you. A great <clears throat> recommendation. You may proceed. Okay. So I think I'll go quickly. I forgot where I think we were on to B. Yes, uh, option B here. Uh, so uh, going here, you'll see just the the parking utilizing the whole whole site itself. No structured parking. Uh, that really has to do with the the, the size uh, uh, decrease of about twenty thousand square feet. Um, but very similar layout, uh, dealing with sort of the same energy and parameters. <laughs> Uh, but that reduction in square footage means we're getting all of our program on two levels. And so here, are, instead of our gym, gym being on the second level, basically we flip-flop fitness room and gymnasium or multi-purpose gymnasium uh, around in the diagram from option A. So the multi-purpose gym, two-court gym, the pool, all on that lower level. You've got uh, a bank of community space uh, activities as you come in, your central administration, um, and then as you move to the upper level, uh, similar where we've got uh, the, the multi-purpose community uh, room here, it's for uh, 200, so it's basically 1,000 square feet smaller than, than in the other option. But very similar program elements, just a, a few left out uh, from like what we discussed uh, in uh, looking at the program. So here we got the larger recreation pool water, the smaller six-lane pool. You can kind of see how they're laid out all centrally around the locker room that kind of is the pinwheel that has all the rest of the program areas coming off of it. You've got, uh, as your entry, again, the multi-purpose cultural center kind of greeting people as they come in, multiple lounge spaces for that informal gathering around um, uh, on this level, and the courtyard on, on the southwest uh, corner there. And then as you go to the upper level, here we've got the large, uh, 5,400 square foot uh, fitness room that has direct access right on the walk jog track. So really great for functional training or all kinds of activities you can do there. Uh, your community room, uh, as I said, down on, on this side and multi-purpose. And then same similar concept where just looking at ways to maximize daylight and sustainable practices within the building's architecture. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Curtis. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you everyone for coming from Portland, right? 
Oh. Um, I have a question about the difference between the six and the eight lanes. Have we done analysis to, to um, see what the impact would be on meeting the need for swim lessons? Yes, yeah, so the, the primary difference with the six lane, the eight lane is obviously on the capacity, but when we showed the six lane, we also increased the square footage of the shallow warmer water pool. And so with that in mind, we would really see the majority of the swimming lessons being taking, taking place within that shallow uh, warmer water. Because typically when we have a two pool facility like this, we'll have the lap pool it might be set at 82 degrees, while the recreational programming pool is going to be set a little bit higher at, at 86. And so that way you can really cater to those different aquatic user groups. But we would see the primary uh, place for at least the entry-level swimming lessons taking place in that recreational pool. So that was going to be my next question. So entry-level swimming lessons are the younger kids. How deep is the recreational pool? So we would typically see that in the neighborhood of probably two to two and a half to four and a half feet of water. Okay, and then to my question to Parks then, you know, we've got a great need, wait list for swim lessons. Is it, is it primarily the younger kids that are not getting into swim lessons or is it across the board in our age groups? I actually do not know the answer to that question. I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'll, um, we can come back. One more. Oh, <laughs> question. Council Member Falcon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Sorry, I was processing what Council Member Curtis has said while I was, and we we're moving on. Um, I have a follow-up question about her question, is that if we're not going to be using the six or eight lane pools for swim lessons, then is the primary purpose for competitive swimming? Because that's a pretty big, uh, it seems like a pretty big uh, part of the footprint for a very small group of folks. Yeah, so I would say that the, the lap and, and fitness pool is primarily for community programming. And so uh, that typically starts early morning with lap swim, uh, even some water walking in the shallow end. You can support both shallow and deep water aerobics uh, within the pool. There is the opportunity that, you know, that there could be uh, swim, local swim teams that might uh, want to rent lane space uh, you know, on a daily basis. And so uh, that's where the eight lane would, would come into play because you could generate revenue on maybe half of the pool from a swim club, but then you could still have the other half available for community programming. But we would also see a lot of the higher level lessons being um, programmed in that lap pool because, you know, once you get to say a level three, four, and five, you're swimming the entire length of the pool. And so that area would be necessary to have those higher level uh, programs and so uh, yes we could do you could do competitive swimming and swim practice in there but we would also see that there's just such a great need for community programming in terms of fitness and wellness that would take place in those pools good answer thank you yep. and so for competitive swimming is four lanes kind of the minimum for practice of what would be needed you so like usually about half could be used for the eight lane yeah so usually it just depends on the the size of the the team and how much lane space you know starting with the ages you know, six to 10, you know, you can get probably six to seven kids in a lane. By the time they hit 12 to 14, it drops to five per lane. By the time they're at high school, 16 to 18, it's, it's probably three to four uh, per lane. And so it really depends on the number of swimmers and how they're, how they're distributed. Uh, for competitive purposes, the minimum would be a six lane pool to run a, you know, a competitive swimming event. But for practice, a lot of the clubs here, since there's such a shortage of water just in this entire area, that they, they will take what they could get. And so, you know, if you could rent out four lanes, then they could accommodate anywhere from, you know, 20 to, to 30 swimmers at a time every hour for a few hours in the afternoon. And do you think we could re recoup more, um, get more revenue then if we were to have the eight lane because it's more likely to attract, like, competition, regional competitions than a six lane lap pool would? Uh, the eight lane could, but then there's going to be a spectator seating requirement. And so to, if you want to host regional competitions and you really need to program in probably, you know, 400 to 600 spectator seats, which could, you know, tack on an additional, 
um, you know, four four thousand square feet to the facility that's designated for the the spectator seating. But the eight lane would be more attractive than the six lane, just because you can accommodate more swimmers, you can run meets more efficiently. But either the six lane or the eight lane, we would see, you know, primarily that would be for maybe a dual and tri meets, maybe a smaller invitational. But then if you go to those regional meets, you're going to have to increase the size of the spectator seating. Great, thank you. Okay, so that was my question just following up on, oh. I was just gonna offer, when we built the operational model, we really looked at it from a perspective of a practice facility, not necessarily a competition facility. So with the eight lane, it was with the idea that the if it was a high school team or a club team, um, they wouldn't have ex exclusive use. There would at least be one lane that was available for lap swimming and the same thing with the six lane variety. So we, we didn't, Again, we looked at it as a, more of a practice facility than a competition facility. And that extra, going back to my earlier question, extra kind of 5,000 square feet of just like decking area, because it seems like the water area with option A and B are about the same, right? What is that? Is that usable space or is that just how it's configured? It's just extra, um, I mean, we're going from, we're having a bigger indoor recreation pool with option B, but a um, smaller number of lanes. So there's a couple different things that, you know, obviously there's a, a, a calculation that George could probably speak better to than I can in terms of the amount of deck space versus square footage of water area. The other thing that you have going on is if you go to a little bit bigger of a recreation pool, then you're going to go ahead and the number of people that, can, that will use a recreation pool at one time is higher than could use a lap pool. So now you've got people transitioning in and out of classes, you have people coming in and out when they're using the facility. So the demand is just higher for that deck space. Is it usable space? It goes ahead and you'd be surprised the number of people that wanna be close to the water but not in the water. So I, I would suggest that it is a usable space but more from a social aspect than a physical activity aspect. Thank you, I still have my other question but was this related to? Okay. Well, that was just follow up to Councilor Curtis's yeah. question about this. So thank you for that, uh, Councilor Curtis. Um, my other question was about the gym space and um, the multi-purpose gym. And we have the, um, the community events room that's on the floor above that, if I'm understanding correctly. And there are there's an elevator close by. Could we use the big gymnasium also for events, like for large events? Because that's a huge need here. Um, on the east side and in Kirkland, right? And so if we were going from 300 to 200 capacity for that space that's on the second floor, would we still have the option if there's like the catering kitchen on that second floor to bring stuff down on the elevator and still host an event? Is there something, anything about the flooring or that anything about that space that I'm not thinking of that would um, prohibit us or make it more challenging to hold a large event in the gymnasium? No, I think the, uh, the large gym can definitely be used for community events and oftentimes it involves having some protective flooring that's uh, rolled out and of course you want to make sure the storage area which we've made good provisions for can accommodate that and there's different systems to make it easier to roll that protective flooring material out also you know we'd want to give real consideration as we would anyway to the acoustics of the room and uh, also, oftentimes the gymnasium wants to be more open and connect to the rest of the facility. And if you need enhanced separation, you can also use glass or other methods. So it's definitely uh, within the possibilities to make that a very uh, active space. It could be used for trade shows and community events, all sorts of things. So, Giving all the so. right answers. Thank you. Answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do have a, a answer to Council Member Curtis's question from earlier. Our recreation manager has informed us that the demand for swim lessons is higher with the younger ages, but the wait list is actually spread out throughout all ages. And just to do a, a tag on with the recreation pool, another reason why with the recreation pool it has a larger deck is that pool usually has some shaping to it. And so it just results also in, in more deck area as well. So. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Council Mayor Falcone. Those were awesome questions. I was gonna assume that there's some sort of code requirements for a certain amount of deck space around a body of water so we don't have people following in. Plus, we have moms and dads and guardians that wanna watch swim lessons when they're that happening. Might be a um, I think what would be helpful is um, the 
this to me this this pool is a is a a programming pool. It's not a competition pool, even though everyone knows I love competitive swimming, but it's can we do lap swim while we're doing lessons, while we're doing water aerobics, while we're doing running in water and all of those things? So what might be helpful is sort of back to my question about six lanes versus eight lanes, is can we lay the programming on top of this, these schematics? So eight lanes, the, this is what we can accommodate per hour in the pool. Uh, if we have a gym, these are the kind of things that we can accommodate so that we can all visually, visually, um, analytically look at what if are we serving the needs with these facilities, and that'll help us make that judgment. I really also like Councilmember Falcone's question about you, extra you, additional uses for the gym because we don't have convention spaces in Kirkland, and this might be an opportunity that we do an after hours. Um, Chamber of Congress gala or something and like that. So thank you for that question. I, I think that it would be possible to go ahead and to do those overlays with the programs in the various areas. There's one program that we, and I might be jumping off on a tangent, but it seems timely. There's one program that we haven't talked about yet, and that's membership to the facility. Um, when you look at the revenue models that you guys have and that we've built, Membership to the facility accounts for about 70% of total revenue generation, and that's annual members, daily admissions, those kinds of things. So when you look at this facility and you think about all the wonderful programs that you can do in a facility, part of the reason why people have a membership is so that they can come and use the facility as they see fit. So I, I think that there are opportunities to go ahead and maximize some of those things, and especially at specific days and times and uses. But I think one of the challenges that you're going to run into, um, and everyone runs into it, this isn't something unique to you guys, is that uh, if you program, 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 is there a revenue generation component to that? Yes, there is. But you can also see a decreased revenue generation component through your membership loss. So it's just a really delicate balance that you have to go ahead and that you have to work through um, in the process of figuring out how to make this thing work. So let's uh, move on to the other side, North Kirkland. Um, this is showing the context for the North Kirkland uh, Community Center and Park. Uh, has a great address on 124th um, Street. And uh, this particular plan is showing the, uh, the adjacent park area in orange. That's for the, uh, the playground for children. So the actual site area that we're looking at for the community center is 3.8 acres. Um, a little more focused in detailed plan of the site. Uh, you'll notice uh, uh, it has uh, great transportation uh, with bus stops. Uh, we also took a close look at this site relative to traffic flow uh, into 103rd. Um, a traffic engineer that we worked with uh, suggested that really for this site it would want to have a signaled intersection um, that would also serve the neighborhood to the south. There would be some frontage improvements on 103rd to provide for better queuing of vehicles coming in and out of the site. And you'll notice the, uh, the pink arrow into what the, the number two is. That would be our access point to a parking area. So having that length of, uh, of access and queuing along 103rd is really important. Um, as we get further into design, uh, the, the actual configuration of the drop-off and parking area for the children's playground might adjust or change. Right now, we're basically kind of showing it as it is. And then lastly, there's uh, uh, a, quite a bit of topography across the site too. That's what those dashed lines represent, roughly about 20 feet. And then the program, we similar as, as uh, Mary mentioned, there's a, a larger program option and then a more modest one. Um, the larger one being 74,000 square feet and approximately 250 parking stalls. And just to, uh, to kind of share what the difference is in, in option B1, where we're down to 49,000 square feet, we're looking at uh, still including a two court gym but not having a walk-jog track that takes out some square footage. Uh, the, the fitness areas and, and the multi-purpose uh, exercise areas are similar. Um, 
In option B1, there is no recreation pool. Um, that's a big difference, whereas in option A1, that's a primary feature. And then community spaces, a lot of them are carry over from option A, but there are some areas that are reduced, such as senior lounge and the multicultural center space, the teen lounge, uh, music room, and uh, birthday party rooms. Um, so with that reduced square footage of 49,000 square feet, we're about 155 parking stalls. And then on B2, really the only difference there is instead of a gymnasium, the option, what if you built a recreation pool in that same amount of square footage? Um, this is the site plan for option A. Um, uh, indicates a kind of pull-off area for the playground, which and some limited parking that could be reconfigured, as I mentioned, but uh, no matter what, we would maintain that resource. That's a really important thing that we uh, understand. And then as you drive up and come into uh, the parking area, it's 252 stalls. It's uh, stacked on two levels. One is right at grade and one's below grade, which works out well because of the sloping topography. Um, it kind of tucks into the land and would have good daylighting uh, towards the west and also towards the north. Um, and the way this works is as you drive in, uh, heading towards the west, uh, you would go clockwise and basically have a, a great kind of drop-off area right in front of the uh, entry, as well as ADA parking. That's a kind of indented area near the word entry. So we're getting a great drop-off area as well as accessible parking stalls right next to the building. Um, one could drop people off and then just head back out uh, the way you came in. So it works really nice. It's just a circular drop off. Or if uh, you can't find a parking stall in the upper level, there's a ramp that takes you down to the lower level, which is uh, at the north end of the parking structure. Uh, I would have parking on either side of the ramp, so it's highly efficient. Um, we're also looking at um, creating uh, a very safe access across to the uh, children's play area. You can see the kind of white dash lines that represents an area where we would actually lift up uh, the paving to be at the same level as the sidewalk. Uh, it's a traffic calming device and to really accentuate and make a safe connection between these two parcels of land. Um, a stacking diagram similar to what kind of Chris shared. Um, community spaces up above and more of the recreation spaces below. Uh, this is the main level. Uh, the entry is up in the uh, north uh, east corner. As you come in, there would be a lounge area. The purple indicates administration. If you're walking towards the west, uh, that would be the way that you would gain access through a stair and an elevator to the lower level where the recreation functions are. There would be a child watch, uh, safe kind of location to uh, have your uh, kids uh, be in a, in a safe spot while you work out. It would also, uh, at that point, give you direct access to the walk-jog track. And then uh, kind of wrapping around the heart of the building where the gymnasium is are a series of community spaces, a senior lounge right next to the uh, main entry, uh, community room that could be subdivided, a catering kitchen, and then facing south, a music room, game room, teen multi-purpose area that could be a roof terrace perhaps, as well as multi-cultural center and arts and crafts studio. Um, as you go to the lower level, uh, you would come down through elevator and stairs and you would kind of look directly into the recreation pool, also have views into the multi-purpose gym, really convenient access to changing and locker rooms. And then as you go towards walking down the hallway towards the south, uh, there's a couple of the group exercise rooms, as well as a large fitness room that looks out into the park-like setting. Uh, this is a visualization of the facility. One of the things that we look carefully at is how does the scale of this facility feel compatible within a residential context? So that was a really important driver. Also sustainability, you can see another view of a similar approach to roof monitors where you get the great north light but it becomes an ideal location for PV panels. These types of facilities in either location are also uh, great sites for resiliency to support uh, a cooling shelter or just uh, if there's an event, a safe place for the community 
to come. So there's so many different aspects to what this provides. Um, a little bit of a close-up view of the entry. Again, that kind of human scale, a lot of warmth perhaps of wood and, and great daylighting. Uh, that's something I think is so inherent to these types of facilities. And then uh, very quickly, you know, option B1 and B2, similar site plan. What's interesting is the building does get smaller. The parking structure serves 150, five stalls versus 250. So uh, just the kind of, what it does is also preserve more of the park-like environment around the building. Um, stacking diagram. And then the, uh, the plan, you can see it's a little more uh, compressed. Uh, Admin right at the entry, and then a bar of community uh, rooms, game room, arts and crafts, overlooks into the gymnasium, um, as well as having the multi-purpose rooms and uh, fitness space facing out towards really kind of a, it's not a large area, but it's a park-like environment. There's a trail that leads back to the high school. It's some really nice stand of trees, so it, it really has that kind of quality of a retreat setting. And then um, an option B2, uh, the only real difference here is switching out uh, the gym space for a pool. Uh, with that, we have uh, these, this kind of meeting, uh, birthday party room and lounge area overlooking the pool. And then down below, uh, kind of a zone of pool storage and aquatic staff and lounge connecting to the recreation pool that could have water slides and uh, zero depth entry, a lot of really interesting features to be uh, determined, you know, during the design phase. Uh, views of, of the facility. Uh, as you drive up, it's interesting where the gym kind of pulls closer to the road where you get views in. That would also be true if that was a swimming pool in that location. Um, and then the, uh, another version of the entry at this uh, option. Well, maybe we can move on to capital costs, operational costs. Oh, questions on that layout? I didn't um, see any. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so now that we've taken a look at all all the various options at the two sites, I uh, just want to take a moment to kind of look at, you know, what what do these various options cost? And and so what we've got here um, are a listing of the costs. So what you've got on the on the top line there is the building. So that's that those would be the building costs in 2025 dollars. So that all these numbers have been escalated uh, to assuming assuming construction two two years from now. Uh, the site work is just that. That's all, all your site work and all your surface parking. Um, and then so that gives you a construction, that construction cost total. Um, and then your soft costs are, are calculated as a percentage of about 30% of, of your construction costs. And so that includes everything uh, from uh, fees to permitting to all your furniture, uh, what we call FF and E in the project. Um, would be included in those soft costs. So when you total that up, so for the total project cost, for instance, Coton Park and Ride A, you got the 132, you're at 108 for option B, you're also at 108 for option A in North Kirkland, 83 million uh, for option uh, B1, and then 87 million for B2. S same size, but the aquatics is more expensive, so that's where you, where you see that, that differentiation there. Um, and so, uh, so uh, day one, you open up, everything's in place. That's what's in this in that total project cost number there. So Let's when we oh, sorry, sorry, thank you, Madam Mayor. I didn't realize we we're going to move off the slide so quickly. Well, we're going to be jumping around a lot of numbers here, but <laughs> um, uh, here I'm just trying to be helpful. I, I wonder if the answer to Councilmember Pascal's earlier question about the garage is buried in the differential in the site work of 14 million versus 8 million um, is it safe to assume that that 6 million difference is roughly um, that parking structure that yes where pascal is talking yes about? so that that that's where you're seeing uh exa that's exactly correct okay. yes you're, right. you're seeing that that basically 7 million uh or six six million dollar differentiation between the site work is that parking structure and if it were a phase two, that would be a $6 million savings. Yeah. $6 million, we'd have to find a, 
funding for later if we needed phase two. Okay. Right. Thank you. Anything else, Ms. Clay? So with each of the options, we went ahead and put together a pretty comprehensive operational plan. Um, we used city full-time rates and part-time rates. Uh, we went ahead and we built that from the ground up. Um, commodities, contractual obligations, we factored in the 18% city chargebacks. We used the IT chargeback. And one of the things that we did um, that's a little different is that we went ahead and began to make recommendations of what you should allocate each year to go into an improvement fund. Um, depending upon how you operate your facility, um, there's going to come a time where you're going to have to replace treadmills, that you're going to have to replace some of those lou the lounge furniture, right? You don't want to buy the great industrial stuff that looks the same 20 years from now. Great, it lasted 20 years, but it looks 20 years old. So um, trying to build some of those reserves early on. Uh, Revenue is really focused on admissions, programs, rentals, birthday parties, other. For North Kirkland, we did go ahead and take the level of programming that exists at that facility now and the revenue and the expenses associated with that and rolled it into that updated budget that we created. Um, from a staffing perspective, that goes ahead and provides you all of the different positions that are in the, in the, in the model. A um, couple things to, to take into account. Um, not every model has two aquatics positions. Um, in some of the bigger models, there are two aquatics positions. Obviously, there's no aquatics positions when there's not a pool, um, but it's something to go ahead and consider. Um, we did go ahead and factor in the idea of having full-time lifeguards. If you follow that at all, um, that is a significant challenge right now and something that maybe can maybe a little different than how you go ahead and currently operate, but we did go ahead and make a recommendation that there would be dedicated maintenance and custodial staff to the facility. You're going to see these facilities operating between 95 and 100 hours a week. Um, so they're really kind of operating in that business mode. So being able to go ahead and have those positions on, on hand and being able to do the type of maintenance and work that needs to be done is going to be important. Uh, just you. Councilmember Falcone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, thank you for mentioning the assumption of the um, programming at the North Kirkland Community Center. And I had a question related to that. Um, you know, one consideration that's obviously different here is both the short, short and long-term implications of doing a project here on the programming. Um, <clears throat> so have we done a comparison as far as what types of facilities are in each of the three options at the North Kirkland Community, Community Center site? as to what impact that would have on the programming that we compare to what we currently offer? Like, could we still offer everything that we're offering now? Could we offer more? And that's more like a long-term uh, question, and then also short-term in the interim, do we have a plan for how we would continue programming that we currently offer while construction's happening, or would we just have a temporary reduction in programming of the nature that's at that center? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> For your long-term ones, the answer is yes and yes. We did look at all the programming that we have and the spaces that are planned would accommodate all the current programming and then more, significantly more. Uh, and then for the short term, we really don't have a plan yet. Uh, we were just not sure what facilities would be built and in what sequence. Um, but it, most likely there would be a reduction in programming. Uh, it wouldn't all be able to be accommodated at, at the Peter Kirk Center. Um, one potential scenario is that there's two facilities, uh, in which case we'd recommend to build Houghton first. So you add all of that capacity so there isn't a significant loss to the community during NKCC construction. Great. Thank you. Uh, other clients that we've worked with have run into that situation where they haven't been able to sustain uh, the exact level of programming, but they've gone ahead and made a concerted effort of still offering programs, still being out there in the community, talking about what's coming up. And while you do see a drop during that construction time, it almost comes back instantaneously with the addition of the new facility. Um, the screen that you have in front of you takes numbers and goes one step further. Um, shame on us for going ahead and throwing all this information in numbers at you at this time of night. Everyone's <laughs> glazing over. Um, the yellow numbers are, are the operational models that we went ahead and built. So we went ahead and looked at expenses, revenues, and then there's a level of subsidy. Um, I went ahead and just playing around with stuff. Uh, because we try and build this so we can do a little gamesmanship. Those cost recovery numbers, obviously, if you go ahead and if you pull 
uh, the capital improvement allocation and the IT and, and those kinds of things out of there, the, the numbers jump up significantly. Um, but we wanted to make sure that it was modeled on how you guys go ahead and do business. Um, we take a conservative approach when we put that information together. Uh, if you look at Houghton A and B and North Kirkland option A, um, the membership numbers there, the membership figures are almost identical in terms of what people would pay for an annual membership because of the in, because of the facilities that are packaged together and the facilities that would demand a membership. Obviously, there's some variance to that when you look at option B1 and option B2 at North Kirkland. Um, same thing when you go ahead, <clears throat> excuse me, and you start talking about penetration rates for households and those types of things. But um, just off the top of my head, when you're talking about Houghton Park and Ride, both of those options are generating well over close to 400,000 400, visits a year when you talk about membership use and daily use. And that doesn't talk about the level of programming that's taking place as well, just the amount of foot traffic through there. So um, do I think you could go ahead and exceed those numbers? Yeah, I think you could. But I think you're going to have to do that very uh, delicate balance of how much program do we do versus how many members do we have in our facility. So normal uh, and parks and recreation folks will laugh at me when I talk about normal and parks and recreation. But when you open a building like this, when you finally hit normal is year three. Um, so you take your information, your first year of operation, your second year of operation. By the time you hit year three, everything's off a of warranty. The staff has figured out how to operate the building. You've gone ahead and you've seen some peaks and valleys. Um, that's when things really go ahead and start to start to go ahead and, and see normal. Um, we've provided a five-year projection in terms of revenue and expenses. Going beyond that gets a little irresponsible just from a standpoint of market shifts, and it also comes into uh, if you adopt the Disney model, after five years you're going to go ahead and change something or you're going to improve something in the facility, which goes ahead and maintains your membership. Um, if you don't do that, you could start to see those things slip. Councilmember Falcon. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. You can tell I'm so passionate about this, as I know Councilmember Curtis is too, but she has the, the luxury of being at all those meetings and so probably has a lot of her questions answered. Um, so thank you for humoring me. Um, <clears throat> in the um, cost estimates here, you talk about memberships. Um, to what extent have we considered like free and reduced memberships for folks um, who may uh, need that based on affordability in the community? And have we done an analysis of you know, what proportion of our residents we believe would qualify for that and need that? It's a great question. Um, we went ahead and we built the membership rates based on the market. Um, so we didn't want to be at the top end of the market. We didn't want to be at the bottom end of the market, right? These facilities many times go ahead and become gateways to pro private providers. That's a separate thing. My assumption, while I didn't go ahead and write out what the philosophy would be, but knowing the staff here and knowing how you guys operate is that there would be some type of scholarship program or something along those lines. Did we go ahead and did we put that hard and fast into numbers? We did not do that. We didn't go through that exercise. Okay, now I looked at the, the, the hard costs and the operating costs. Kind of want to look at uh, this slide here. To what, well, what does this mean to, to, to Kirkland and, as, and its residents? And so uh, there in, in, in the green, so the first two lines are what we just reviewed in the, in the previous two slides. And then in the green slide, you're looking at the annual cost per thousand dollars. So uh, for every thousand dollars of assessed value, uh, you're looking uh, like everything from, well, I'll just go through in 23 cents, basically on, on, on Houghton A, 19, on B, uh, 18, on A for Kirkland, North Kirkland, North Kirkland B1, 15, and 16 for B2 and North Kirkland. What does that mean for annual cost per hundred, for a million dollar home? This, uh, this would be your annual cost, $230, 190, 186, 154, and 161. So the, that would be the general, give you a, a feel of, of, of the range of costs for uh, the information that we've presented uh, previously here tonight. Obviously, we've presented these options, and there's a lot of pros and cons to mostly pros, actually. But we wanted to just share um, just some thoughts about how one might approach evaluation and how we thought about it a little bit. 
Um, we do think at the Helm Park and Ride, the option A really maximizes the, optimizes the site capacity. You know, as it's hard to develop land, how do you maximize the value of that land? And, and not only that, but on this site, these tremendous views out to Lake Washington. Uh, even the address of this facility from 405 as you drive by when it's three stories versus two, more identity, more presence. So we think those are all positive things and, and frankly can have impact on cost recovery uh, that, you know, I'm not sure if that's totally been dialed in yet, but that type of presence and identity uh, can really help with the operating costs. You know, option B, you know, it definitely fits comfortably on the site, does have good identity, uh, has a good mix of program and activities, although, and obviously the additional uh, 23,000 square feet allow for an expanded program and uh, activity spaces. Um, so that's just kind of a, a quick look at uh, those two options. Um, and then North Kirkland, uh, we've got the larger 74,000 compared to the 49,000. Uh, obviously you get more expanded program uh, spaces and opportunities. Uh, still has a good scale with the neighborhood. Uh, does require a little more uh, open space as compared to the smaller footprint where you do see a little more of the park-like environment preserved. Um, and, uh, you know, the scale is not for the building that different, but, you know, quite a bit more parking. Uh, so there's just, there is that kind of balance. Uh, we think either of these could work, but uh, maybe the smaller one might feel more appropriate. But then there's that balance of, if you're building one facility versus two, um, you know, and, and the question essentially that Lynn was raising is the real big question of one or two facilities. And if you had a larger facility at Helm Park and Ride, perhaps a smaller one here, you know, we, we also know there's other aquatic plans for up north, you know, and how does, if that comes around, how is that all balanced with your facilities? There is, issue of equity. We found that in other projects where you build the brand new shiny facility and you have an existing one. And, you know, the, uh, the appeal of that second facility is, uh, is downgraded. You know, people feel, oh, wow, this is, feels kind of old and tired. And if you, these are all things, considerations. I'm just brainstorming. But, you know, when you do uh, one larger one, does it, how does that balance the equity uh, equation as well. So those are just thoughts that are random thoughts kind of going through our head and wanted to open it up. Uh, Deputy Mayor Arnold. Thank you, Jim for, and Lynn for mentioning the uh, a discussion about a two facility option because you say either or to a group like us and we might end up saying some form of both. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Without um, prejudging what's going to come out of PFAC, um, is that group, because I know they've been living this for months and really will appreciate how they come up with some recommendations, are they looking at two facility options as well? Because you add this up and we're above 300 before we even have looked at parks, open space, or any other programming that could get funded with this ballot measure. So it seems pretty expensive to do both given what we've seen here. It does. There has been discussion on that. And in fact, that's what Hillary is going to show you next is some preliminary polling from PFAC and, and what those numbers are for one versus two facilities. Um, there's going to be a lot more discussion. So this is very preliminary. Um, and some folks are requesting some different scaling besides the square footages that we've offered. And, and that is absolutely feasible. That, that was going to be my next question is, is there options that say if we were going to go with a two facility option, is there an option A, Houghton, plus an option C, North Kirkland, given the useful life of the North Kirkland Community Center today, we've got to do something there. Right, exactly. As you mentioned, um, it, it kind of is reaching the end of its useful life. So we, we do actually have to do something about the facility. What that is, I, I don't really know. Um, 
but yes, there could be a very a variety of different options that we could select from. And one of the beauties of the study is there's four different sizes of square footage. And so we do have rough cost for, per square footage and we could do some basic modeling to look at other square foot side, sizes. Um, and then also just kind of do some shifting between the two facilities. So there's a lot more that could be done. Um, this just provides us with the preliminary information and we, we can go further from there. Thank you. And then uh, Hillary here is gonna, we might wanna skip this slide here and go straight to the PFEC um, preliminary polling. Great, so PFEC has two meetings left after this. Um, their next one's this Thursday and they'll be wrapping up next Thursday. And so the, the, this slide and I have one after this have information from last week's PFEC meeting on Monday, February 13th. And this is preliminary information like Lynn just mentioned and shouldn't be taken as a recommendation. Um, PFEC members are currently completing another kind of we do between meetings. We've been using the balancing act tool similarly to that we use during the budget season um, to put their packages together and looking at the 22 potential ballot measure elements that were presented as well as what they think their cap amount should be. So at last, meeting, last Monday's meeting, there were 31 PFEC members in attendance, um, plus our PFEC chair, Councilmember Curtis. Um, and as the chair, Councilmember Curtis does not vote in any of these polling items. Um, and after some discussion about potential, the potential number of facilities, we did a poll. And you see the results of that poll on this slide. And so we asked PFEC members how many facilities they wanted. 53% of the 30 folks that voted said they wanted one facility. 43% said they wanted two facilities, and one person said they preferred no facilities. And then we talked about money. Um, so when talking about the potential ballot measure costs, um, like Chris showed on the slide that had cents per thousand and the cost impact to the $1 million homeowner, we've been using a lot that kind of cost impact to the 1 million home compare elements between these facilities as well as the other elements PFEC is looking at. And then um, just the quick way to calculate this into the estimated tax rate per 1,000 of assessed value would be to take the numbers you see on the screen that are per million home and divide that by 1,000 to get the cents per 1,000. So after discussing the, the cap ranges that PFEC members were interested in, we did, did another poll, and that's the left side of the screen that you can see here. And as you can see, most PFEC members were really looking at um, wanting something the cap range for the million dollar home impact to be between $221 and $309 per year. And then we took that and we went, wanted to get a little bit more narrow and see what PFEC members thought. And as you can see on the right side of the screen, um, there is a lot of variation between PFEC members' preferences when we looked more narrowly at the um, $70 or $80 range between $230 and $300 annually. Um, so that's kind of where PFEC is at the moment. And both the cap amount and the number of facilities are things that PFEC members are continuing to talk about. And we're really looking forward to bringing back the PFEC recommendation in a month from today on March 21st, once they've had time to finalize that recommendation. And now we've reached the time for um, questions and answers. And we're at the end of our prepared slides. Um, I really just want to thank you all for having this great team here today um, and want to turn it back to you. And as a reminder, we have our great um, experts, of the consultants in the room. And so questions about the facilities um, will be really helpful. And I'm looking forward to talking more about PFEC um, after we wrap up with PFEC. Excellent. Thank you. Council, discussion, questions? I think this has been a fabulous presentation. My problem is I want it all. <laughs> uh, Neil, or Council Mayor Black. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So a couple questions. Um, one hopefully is a fairly straightforward one. Um, Non-resident memberships, I assume the memberships that we're talking about include non-residents being able to purchase a membership if, if it makes sense for them. Yes. Yes. Okay, and right. we would actually expect to see quite a bit of that at the Houghton facility due to its location. It will likely have a fair amount of appeal to Redmond and Bellevue. Okay. Uh, and Kirkland residents are generally uh, uh, welcome to at our neighbors' uh, facilities, our neighboring jurisdictions' facilities as well, I assume. Um, the, uh, I'm guessing this is a question for the city manager, um, but looking at these numbers, um, 
is uh, these capital expenses are going to be uh, it, um, presumably we're going to be um, uh, it's going to be maintenance on uh, a debt facility of debt. some kind. Um, so is at some point that debt is going to be paid off and we're going to have ongoing operational expenses uh, net of uh, memberships and, uh, and whatnot. So is the idea of this is a permanent levy or is this, do you? That's actually one of the issues that we're still going to bring to PFEC and also be a decision of the council, but the options we're going to be presenting to them are, do you want to look at one large permanent levy? Do you want to look at a capital levy and an operating levy? Do you want to have those two things um, in tandem? And so we're going to be walking through all that with PFEC as a recommendation, but there's a variety of different ways that they might recommend and that the council might ultimately decide. The numbers that we're seeing, though, what is, does that make any assumption whatsoever? The the uh, cents per thousand, does it make any assumption? Other than debt service on the capital itself, it doesn't presume a particular ballot measure type yet. But okay. It does assume debt service and operating service um, costs. Okay. And, and I'll just add that the, the debt service um, was all of the calculations for the capital costs were based on a 20-year bond. That doesn't mean that that's exactly what will be proposed, but that's just so that you know what was on the materials presented to you. Okay. Uh, and then one more question. Um, I'm just curious, given um, the variation that we saw on that very last slide um, among PFEC members, um, how much effort, and maybe this is a question for Councilmember Curtis, maybe as the chair of the PFAC, maybe it's a question for Mary or Lynn, I don't know, but how much effort is going to be made to try to reach a consensus recommendation from PFEC as opposed to a polling results? Are, um, hopefully that, that question kind of makes sense. I'm just curious. I, I was going to save my comment for last, but since you responded. Um, I'm confident that PFAC will bring to Council a strong recommendation that is a consensus. The PFAC team members are, have immersed themselves so deeply in this, and they are asking the really hard questions. And, and there's so much nuance and thought to what they're coming to. They also have shown a strong commitment, and I, I hear what you're saying. You look at we're two, two, two ends of the spectrum. Is it two or is it one? We have two meetings left. I'm confident that if we're not there in the next meeting, we'll add extra meetings if we need to, but we will come forward with um, something that's worthwhile for council to look at. If I could also add, we did tell all PFEC members that we'd include any essentially minority report. So if a member wanted to express some, you know, extreme of the way too high or way too low or some other comment that we'd make sure the council got that as well. So while you'll get a strong majority recommendation, you'll also be able to see the insight from anyone who didn't feel like they agreed with that or they might have some alternative to that. Great. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Arnold. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, as PFEC grapples with this, I really want to make sure they have the option of a uh, a really good two facility option to, to consider. And while everything you've presented in the slides in the packet, each of those facilities would have stood alone um, and functioned. I'm wondering if you think about it from a complementary standpoint, saying you have a facility at Houghton, what are the extra, fa extra capabilities and uh, facilities that you need to serve the North End if there's any option for a scaled back North Kirkland Community Center that we could put on the the table that would work only as a uh, two facility option so that that's something PFEC is considering when they come back with our recommendation. And would, is there anything, do you need anything from us to make that happen? I don't know the answer to the second part of the question, but uh, I, I think PFEC will certainly be asked the one or two facility question and then we're also asking them how, what, what are their recommendations for scaling? Um, beyond that, we could actually do a great deal of work in really refining the concepts. I mean, we're not in design at this point in time. These are just concepts. Um, but if we knew that we had the two facilities and we still have Peter Kirk, that gives us a little bit more information with which to refine the concepts. So just to make sure I'm understanding, you're, you're saying as an example, what would a 30,000 square foot new 
in KCC that works in tandem with a big Houghton facility or something that's a much smaller scale that something that's smaller. I don't know right. what's most important. Right. Okay. Gym, multi-purpose facilities, classrooms, right. etc. But saying you know, if you're thinking about it as complementary, could it, could a concept be put on the table that uh, PFEC can sit? It has enough information for PFEC to consider uh, for a two-option solution versus what we're seeing here, um, even with the smaller Houghton and the smallest North Kirkland, it doesn't work together. So I want to have something real for them to consider. Councilmember Pascal. Yeah. Are you waiting for an answer for that or just? Well, I, I, I guess my question is, do you need direction from us to say, yeah. you know, I mean, I guess we'll, certainly we'll be create an, know that, an option C. Yeah, that everyone is interested in that option, right? We can do the best we can in a few weeks to get a rough order of magnitude, but we'd also need probably more time to figure out and maybe something that could come back to the council after PFEC. Right? They'd probably be able to vote on a concept, right, but not, not a, nothing to the scale that we've done here so far. Could I, could I? Uh, you want to go first? Yeah. Go ahead. I had a couple questions, but I do want to kind of give my, my input on what uh, Deputy Mayor is saying. The question for me is, is not what that facility looks like. It's whether a second facility can be scaled to where you're only adding, you know, I'm looking at the annual cost, you know, to, to the, uh, added to the property tax, to where you're still staying within that 300 threshold, right? That's the question. Can you build something that where you're only adding a $70 or $60 incremental cost um, and still be able to afford the, the original facility? That's, to me, that's the question. I don't know if that's possible or not. Yeah, I think if you start with a number and work your way back, like what could you get for $25 million as an example, the kind of a thing, right? <clears throat> I think, so I think that would be a valuable uh, thing to, to, to answer and hopefully with kind of minimal, you know, effort. Um, so the, the two questions I had was <clears throat> on the cost, what kind, of, what kind of contingency are we talking about that you've included in there? Is it a pretty significant contingency or what, what is that? Is it like a 30% or I don't know who did the cost, but I'm look, I'm sorry, I was looking at you at the end. <laughs> it's okay, I can give you an answer, but it won't be right. <laughs> Yeah, I can, uh, high level, there's about a 15%, there, there's m multiple contingencies built in there. There are con construction contingencies, uh, so when we're looking at the construction number, there, there's an estimate in there, everything's escalated, not only just to the date, but also to take into account um, uh, any conditions that might happen in the field in reality. There's also design contingencies because we don't have a fully designed product. You know, this is our concepts. And so there's, there's, uh, there are our multipliers that are included that address that as well. So, so the, the numbers that we're sharing here tonight are, are, are healthy numbers. They're, they're pretty conservative. They're, they're not like, w would this might maybe get you there? This is something we definitely want you to have accurate information. So the last thing I want you to do is, is is ha have numbers that you're going out with that that are less and you're having to answer to the, the why you, you can't do what you said you're going to do so the contingencies that you're assuming are are consistent with this level of yes. design and they're, they're con uh, best consistent. practice and also, just also just built in contingencies into the uh soft costs uh, significant right. owner contingencies as well. And then the estimates were all done by DCW based here in Seattle, who's, you know, does a, a really thorough job and really understands the market here as well. Okay. And then the last question, and I, I probably can answer this myself based upon what you said, but do you expect that these costs to change between now and when the PFAC kind of makes a recommendation? Or are these kind of the costs? What? Are these kind of the costs? I think we feel solid with these costs at the moment. Um, you know, it, we are seeing the market changing a bit, being a little more competitive. So, uh, in a way, um, hopefully, their conservative numbers is really where you want to be. Uh, you know, Great. where costs were six months ago, 
um, I think we feel good about these numbers and hopefully if it's flattening out and becoming more competitive out there, but we're also looking out, you know, assuming a bond passes, you know, that's another year and a half from now. So um, continual updated cost estimates would be certainly part of this as it moves into design. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Fal Falcone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, well, I just wanted to loop back to what Deputy Mayor Arnold was suggesting that um, we do and ask staff to do and just wanted to say, yes, I agree with that and also would like staff to have the flexibility. I think I heard um, Deputy Mayor Arnold say to scale back the North Kirkland Community Center site in order to fit within that $300 per um, million dollar assessed value. I would also like staff to have the flexibility to um, be able to scale back the um, Houghton Park and Ride site as well if necessary to work within that. I just wanted to to add that into it, that I think that it might end up being a combination of a little bit of both, maybe more significantly reducing the secondary smaller site in North Kirkham Community Center. <clears throat> but I think it's really key to have that flexibility to be able to stay within that number. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what a powerful presentation. Thank you very much. And keep up the good work. Um, I, think, I think you're hearing an engaged council, as well as an engaged PFEC. So uh, we will see you again. Thanks very much. And we will be adjourned until 7.30. Thank you. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. We are back in session following a study session on a Parks Funding Exploratory Committee Facility Feasibility Study Update. We are at item number five in our agenda communications. This is the time in our meeting when we normally hear from the public on matters that are not quasi-judicial or scheduled for a public hearing, of which there are none scheduled this evening. Please limit your remarks to three minutes and the council will receive up to three comments each on both sides of each issue. If you are present either in person or virtually and would like to address the council during this items from the audience period, please sign up using the online public comment instruction link or in person using the posted QR code. For those participating by phone, please dial star nine to be recognized to speak. Community members will be called in the order in which they are signed up. Items from the audience is an important part of our business meeting and we ask that everyone be treated with kindness and respect. We ask that you please not clap or applaud after a speaker or express your disagreement with a speaker. We want everyone in Kirkland to feel welcome expressing their viewpoints regardless of content. Because they can be disruptive, signs and placards are also not allowed in council chambers during our meetings regardless of their content. City Clerk. We have four speakers signed up, and the first is Benjamin Greshler, followed by Kendall Chapman, Betsy Lewis, and Jeremy Suzuki. And Benjamin is virtual, so we are promoting him now. Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Benjamin. Hi. My name is Benjamin Greshler. Um, I live in the Forbes Creek neighborhood in Kirkland. I go by he, him pronouns, and I'm a transgender man. Um, I actually grew up in Kirkland for part of my childhood from the ages of 12 to 18 years old. Back then, I was really silently struggling with being transgender. Um, I'm 29 years old now. But back then, there was hardly any types of representation or acknowledgement of the LGBTQ plus community that I saw on the greater east side. Uh, for those of you who are not a part of the LGBT plus community, something that, it, that is really important to understand is that representation is so pivotal and necessary to one's own acceptance of themselves. Um, representation and acknowledgement makes individuals feel safe welcomed and supported for who they are. Uh, I think this message is especially important during this moment because of the mounting discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community, whether it be laws outlawing drag shows, preventing trans youth from receiving gender affirming care, violence at LGBTQ plus spaces, I believe Kirkland has an opportunity to make a bold statement about who we are as a city and what we stand for. I can only imagine what the 13-year-old Benjamin Greshler would have felt if I had been walking down the street to see a rainbow crosswalk in my own hometown where I live. So I encourage the city of Kirkland to make this a reality for the LGBTQ plus youth and adults who reside here. That's all. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Benjamin. Our next speaker is Kendall Chapman, also virtual, followed by Betsy Lewis. Kathy, we can't see any speakers. Is that because they're on the phone? Um, they're on. I'm not sure why they're not showing. Why the speakers aren't showing on the screen. No, the speakers. There's Hi there. In Zoom, Hi. but okay. Well, welcome, we Kindle. Hi. Sorry. Can you guys hear me and see me? We if you can can't now. See me, that's too. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, hello, Mayor Sweet and Kirkland City Council members. My name is Kindle Chapman, and I'm a resident of Kirkland, and I live in the Juanita neighborhood. Um, I'm also a board member of Eastside Pride. Um, tonight, I am here to express my strong support for the installation of a Rainbow Pride crosswalk in our city. To me, having a Pride crosswalk would demonstrate that Kirkland is a place where people of all backgrounds and identities are welcome, celebrated, and protected. Additionally, having this crosswalk would send a powerful message to our LGBTQIA residents and visitors and let them know that they're valued members of our Kirkland community. 
It would show that we recognize and appreciate their contributions to our city and that we stand with them in the face of discrimination and hate. As someone who identifies as a part of the LGBTQIA community, the Pride Crosswalk would represent that the city of Kirkland welcomes, accepts, honors, and protects who I am. We have an opportunity to make a bold statement about who we are as a city and what we stand for. Let's take that opportunity and show that Kirkland is a place where everyone is welcome and accepted. Thank you all for letting me speak. Thank you, Kendall. Our next speaker is Betsy Lewis, also virtual. <laughs> Ms. Lewis, are you there? You unmute. <laughs> Betsy, can you unmute? Not sure. We'll take Jeremy Suzuki, who is in the chamber next. And Betsy will try to come back to you, if you can unmute. Welcome, Mr. Suzuki. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Jeremy Suzuki. I am a resident of the beautiful Finn Hill neighborhood here in the city of Kirkland. I am a junior attending Juanita High School, and I am a leader of our school's Gender Sexuality Alliance, also known as GSA. I come here today to speak on behalf of my GSA and for myself and speak in support of the recent proposal, Legislative Request Memorandum Number 022123A, titled The Decorative Crosswalk Intersection for June 2023 Pride Month. I am gay. I count myself to be lucky, extremely lucky, to be able to say this here, to be able to be open about who I am while living in the city. And despite the struggles I've had in this world because of my identity, it has made all the difference to have accepting communities and reliable people in my school and elsewhere here to know that people are on my side in a world of rising hate and targeting of LGBTQ people and in a battle that I can't choose to drop out of because I have an identity that I can't discard. Just as I am Asian American, clearly, I am gay and haven't chosen to be this way. What I did have a choice with though was with choosing to accept and be open with my sexuality. Growing up in a conservative Christian household, this was not easy, to say the least. <laughs> but I remember what helped. Seeing pride flags and rainbow yard signs around the neighborhood, once I learned what they meant, made my existence feel more acceptable, like I can feel safe in this community. I'm still comforted by my neighbor's yard sign across the street whenever I see it to this day. Considering that, please remember the existence of many other members of the LGBTQ community in this city and imagine how impactful pride flags displayed on the street would have on people like me. There is a chance now to help people feel supported while experiencing danger and opposition to their existence in the outside world and, like many students I know do, in their own homes. This proposal requests that pride flags be painted in crosswalks or the middle of intersections in areas with a high volume of pedestrian traffic but a low volume of vehicle traffic, such as the intersection on Park Lane and Main Street. I would appreciate having installations like this there 
and in as many other suitable locations as possible. Jeremy, Jeremy, I'm sorry I have to interrupt you, but you have used all of your time. <laughs> okay. Thank you for having me and having me share uh, my story. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll try Betsy Lewis again. Ms. Lewis, can you hear us? We cannot hear you. Ms. Lewis, I'm going to have to. And it says she's coming. Well, she is coming. Kathy, can we reach out to her and invite her to send us um, communication? We will try to find um, an address for her to see if we can reach out. Okay, great. Because I think um, <laughs> unless there is some anyone else in the audience who wishes to address the council tonight, then I will close this public um, items from the audience period. Uh, with that, that takes, yes, sir, you may. Hi there. Uh, my name is Cole Martin. I'm a recent, uh, recently moved into Kirkland uh, as of uh, last uh, fall. And had I known uh, the topic of conversation uh, for this meeting, I probably would have come a bit more prepared. Um, but I just wish to say how heartwarming it is to feel. Um, I grew up in Iowa, uh, and while it wasn't necessarily a harsh place uh, to grow up uh, for me, uh, being gay, uh, it was certainly not inviting as what I find here. Um, I try to be active in my community, and especially nowadays, uh, looking around uh, to my friends in Texas and Tennessee, uh, it feels a lot of times helpless and hopeless for those in my community. Um, but I can't describe how good it feels to at least wake up and know that I don't have to fight uh, with my neighbors, uh, with the city council, um, with the community of Kirkland uh, to be amongst you all. Um, and I just want to say thank you. And I can't wait for uh, to see the next two years of uh, my residency here okay, uh, with you. all well, of you. Well, maybe I fixed it now. Thank you, Cole. I I it. And welcome to Kirkland. Okay, yeah, it doesn't Betsy, have the red line. Betsy, thank you. Betsy, <laughs> Betsy, Thank you are you. Betsy, you're live. Yes. You're live yes. speaking to the Thank council. You. Okay. You can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, very good. Good evening. On March 25th, 2020, concerned about reduced bus service to the Houghton Park and Ride, I contacted uh, County Council Representative Claudia Balducci. On March 25th, 2020, Blake Trask, who is her communications director and her transportation lead responded to me. Under the heading Houghton Park and Ride to remain a long range parking resource, he wrote, WSDOT and Metro are committed to maintaining this facility and there are no plans to repurpose the location for other purposes. Further, Mr. Trask wrote, Metro staff are currently developing plans for public engagement and outreach with an expected kickoff by early 2021. Houghton Park and Ride will be within the study area for this outreach. There will be an opportunity for giving feedback on ways to integrate Houghton service to connect to these new high capacity transit lines. As you mentioned, he wrote to me, this park and ride provides a potential parking resource for the future. I breathed a sigh of relief, but obviously none of this turned out to be true. Fast forward to today. First, on Mayor Sweet's recommendation, 
King County solid waste included the park and ride on the short list of preferred sites for a new transfer recycling station. Despite the fact the site does not meet the minimum eight acre criteria. Then we learned that WSDOT was surplusing the site and Kirkland was interested in obtaining it for a purpose unknown to us in our neighborhood. In short order, we learned the site is one of two under consideration for an aquatic center. Then WSDOT said they'd made a mistake. They're no longer surplusing the site. And then an agreement was reached that WSDOT and Kirkland can share the site. WSDOT for the purpose of reconfiguring the Northeast 70th place I-405 interchange and Kirkland for a potential aquatic center. To be clear, when I say we, I refer to the South Rose Hill Bridal Trails neighborhood. I serve on our neighborhood association board. While I speak tonight for myself and not the association, I know that we have been not informed by the city about any of these plans. So there's a concerning lack of transparency regarding the park and ride status, and also disregard for our neighborhood's alarm at possibly citing either or both a recycling transfer station and an aquatic center in our neighborhood. According to the city's website, neighborhood associations can offer valuable input on neighborhood planning, like Ms. land use, traffic, and future park improvements. Ms. Lewis, I'm, I'm, I forget I'm going to have to cut you off. Thank you. Right. Thank you for calling. You're welcome. Thanks for starting me up again. Okay, with that, I will call an end to this items from the audience period. Did you want to say something? All right, this will take us to item number seven, special presentations, the Sustainability Neighborhood Ambassador Program, the SNAP program report. City Manager. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So we have two related presentations, both which will be introduced by David Barnes, our senior planner from Planning and Building. And the first is the Neighborhood Ambassador Program. They're gonna have a report on what work they've been up to since the council uh, funded their initiatives. So welcome, David, David, take it away. Thank you, City Manager. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, so back in February, you might remember, 2022, the Sustainability Ambassadors made a presentation to the Council and proposed to take undertake the Sustainability Neighborhood Ambassador Project, or SNAP. I can't SNAP well. In the City of Kirkland, it will help implement the goals and actions of the Sustainability Master Plan. So tonight, the SNAP students are here to present their projects and show the impact that they have made so far. Um, our presenters um, are Gabrielle Hewer, Vernon Lumpkin, and they're both from Lake Washington High School, um, Diva Mehta from Lake Washington High School, and Jinwan Don from Eastside Preparatory School. So with that, I'm going to let them take over and see if they can do this in 10 minutes. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, just give us a second while we set up our presentation. Yeah. All right, hello. Uh, my name is Gabrielle Hewer. I'm a senior at Lake Washington High School. And today we're gonna to be reporting on the SNAP pilot, which stands for Sustainable Neighborhood Ambassadors Program, which has been running through last April till now. So our team is comprised of eight interns, three of which were funded by the great people in front of me, and three were funded by our partnership with Cascade Water Alliance, and two of us are just volunteers. So the purpose of our program was to empower youth to help advance the goals of the city's sustainability master plan. And of course, David, we are so proud of our city's SMP. Um, it really distinguishes Kirkland as a leader in climate action among other cities in King County. So the scope of work of our program is based on five different categories, heat pumps, trees, water, bikes, and solar power. <clears throat> Hi everyone, I'm Vernon Lumpkin. Uh, I'm a senior at Lake Washington High School and I'm here today to, not, to talk not just about what I've accomplished within the scope of our program, but how I've learned and evolved as a consequence of it. 
so I believe that my new awareness has influenced my decisions and, and impact beyond just the internship uh, within my roles as a student leader, a nonprofit head, and just Kirklandian citizen in general. I've been compelled within my leadership, my decision making, and my lifestyle choices to always include a sustainable perspective. And I think that's something that's really powerful. So within the scope, the, supply, the energy supply and emissions section, we worked to create strategic partnerships that would reduce emissions as well as encourage residents to follow incentives that would lead to the implementation of more energy efficient appliances. This was largely based around building the case, which is what we did for a lot of our campaigns where we established a technical, moral, and financial perspective for why certain residents or stakeholders might feel encouraged to implement a technology or take part in certain initiatives. Within the, heat within the heat pump campaign, we conducted information outreach with seven of the 13 neighborhood associations. We coordinated a shift towards heat pumps by working with principals and nonprofits. And I also got five of my own neighbors to install heat pumps, myself included. Hi, my name is Xin Yuan, and I'm a sophomore from Eastside Prep. The best part about being an intern is learning about the different aspects of sustainability and planning my own restoration project, which I will talk about later. We focused on goal 10 of the sustainability master plan, which is to examine trends in canopy gain or loss, identify priorities for meeting the citywide 40% tree canopy cover goal by 2026, and develop strategies to manage Kirkland's urban forest resource for many different aspects. We held three habitat restoration events, and all of them had great turnout. In this picture, it was after a restoration event at the Juanita Beach Park, and we were learning about how to estimate a tree canopy size by measuring the tree trunk. To plan more restoration events, we needed to learn more about trees, so we went on a field trip to see old growth with urban forester Katie as our guide. Katie also taught us about a new tool called the Tree Canopy Plotter. It is an interactive map that can help us to identify underserved communities, design for the SMP goal of 40% tree canopy cover, and make sure that everyone lives within a one-fourth mile of open space. As mentioned earlier, here's my school's plan for a youth-led creek restoration project. On the right is a map of the creek in relation to my school, Eastside Prep. My school is on the bottom right corner, and the creek is just down the road, circled in red. On the left side is a picture how, of how the creek currently looks. The high-level plan is that we will remove invasive species from the creek during summer and replant with native species and trees during the fall and winter this year. And then we will monitor, and th monitor the replanted trees and track the growth for many years after. Hello, everyone. I am Diva Mehta, and I'm a senior at Lake Washington High School. I will be talking about the water aspect of the scope, which was in partnership with Cascade Water Alliance. Throughout this internship, I have learned a great deal about water conservation and where our water comes from. I got the opportunity to tour Tacoma Water Facility and a couple different labs to learn about water and where it comes from at our house. I was able to apply what I learned in several different ways, some of which I will be talking about today. So most of the work we did was surrounding was surrounded three goals. The first one being to reduce water use in buildings by 10% by 2025 and 20% 20 by 2030. The second was to in intensify water conservation efforts through our public private partnerships and outreach and education. And the third to create an education program for water use best practices addressing irrigation overuse and household consumption. We also led a youth led model for how to conduct a home water conservation audit which was basically where we collected a lot of different information, such as the amount of CCF from your water bill, the amount of water that we converted to gallons, our billing cycle, the number of people in the household, and just the water bill and an estimate of how much water we think we use. And we were able to put it into a database and calculate how much water we could be conserving. We also published 15 impact projects, which include templates and student examples. Some of these include hidden toilet leaks, money down the drain, how to make sure that you should start your dishwasher with full loads, as well as washing machines, and how recycling saves water too. Finally, we had three youth voiced expert videos for our classroom on My Water Tower. The first one being searching for information on My City website, the second one visualizing my water pressure zone, and third, why is it so tall? And these are great videos and it'd be great if you could all check them out. 
Hi, Vernon again. I'll be talking about lots more bikes. So within the land use and transportation category of the SMP, we focused on reducing driving per capita um, in reference to the K4C goal, as well as ensuring that all citizens were able to comfortably, sustainably commute by either walking or bicycling. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here to present this himself, but this is VED ready. Uh, he's leading by example. He's one of our volunteer interns, uh, and he started biking in the fall of 2021 to his school, which is 10 miles away across the 520 bridge, Eastside Prep. Uh, so far, he's biked 3,745 miles, and he has saved a lot of CO2. VED is also has already developed a comprehensive biker's education curriculum, which he'll be implementing at Eastside Preparatory School, his high school where he attends, um, which essentially will teach the proper, safe, and sustainable ways of commuting, most notably through biker's education. Uh, we've also designed five new bike micro impact projects for classrooms, which can be used to teach students and be an addition to this biker's education curriculum, which are kind of hands-on projects that they can use to learn. The bike rodeo plan is, if you're not sure what a bike rodeo is, essentially it's a safe environment where we put together events in partnership with schools or other youth groups and we teach uh, kids how to ride bikes safely so that when they become adults and they're participating citizens, they are comfortable adopting sustainable transportation like bikes. And finally, I'd like to close with our Town Hall on Bikes, which is a fantastic event happening on Earth Day, April 22nd. We heavily encourage all of you to attend. Claudia Valducci will be there. Uh, we'll be starting in Juanita and coming south, finishing at Google. We'll be following a lot of events, particularly at schools. Um, there will be a lot of great networking. You guys should attend if you can. Thank you. All right, and finally, wrapping up with solar. Basically, the goal of our solar program was to meet this deliverable of the SMP, which basically encourages Kirkland residents to learn how to get solar panels on their roofs. So we tackled this by starting with a solar neighborhood survey of about 500 homes in Kirkland using a really replicable procedure, taking sunlight data uh, from around Kirkland and converting it into electricity and carbon dioxide tons saved and just a lot of really persuasive data. And that was really helpful when we started our Go Solar webinars, which was a series of four webinars in partnership with Sphere Solar Energy, where we discussed incentives and discounts to go solar and also walked Kirkland residents through the process of getting solar panels installed on their roofs. But SA also did work in the classroom this internship. We had a teacher and student summer workshop on the SMP as a living textbook. We had a town hall at school where 40 AP environmental science students at ICS got to hear from amazing leaders in climate action, including our mayor. And we also had a guest seminar on building a classroom climate action plan. And SA is a regional organization. Even though this program was going on in Kirkland, we're looking to expand. Issaquah actually funded their own SNAP program next year, so they're going to be doing some awesome work. And the Puget Sound Educational Service District funded a CAP Teacher Fellows program in King and Pierce County, which is just awesome to hear. So thank you for hearing us today, and let's do it again. Thank you for hearing us. Oh, yeah. Thank you all so much. Could you come up to the front? We, we want to get a picture with you. Oh, sure. okay. <laughs> yeah. we, have, we have David here to give a picture. Do you want us up here or do you Let's go down. Okay, with that, we are gonna get a sustainability master plan two-year report card. City manager, you wanna introduce Thank, it? That's a great segue, and once again, David Barnes, our senior planner, will be providing the presentation.
Great. Thank you so much. So um, tonight, um, we're not going to rehash the report card. I hope you've enjoyed reading it. Um, I really enjoyed um, making it and also um, you know, bringing to light all the great work that all of the staff and the community has done to you um, through that report. What I decided to focus on tonight was to really looking at some of the positive impacts of some of the actions. Um, and so i um, really proud. In 2021, we had eight actions that we completed. And I was a little, I was really happy with the quality of the actions. But I was reminded by the mayor that, you know, we did, we were going through a pandemic at that point. Um, and so the good news, um, I think, for 2022 is that we were able to um, nearly double our actions that we were able to achieve and, and are ongoing. And also the quality of those actions are amazing. So I think that's a win-win as far as I'm concerned. And we spread um, those actions um, not evenly, but each of the focus areas got some actions, which, which is really great. Um, so you've probably heard about the Energy Smart Eastside, and that you know, is a uh, campaign that uh, we've embarked on, Kirkland, Bellevue, Redmond, Issaquah, Mercer Island, um, to um, get heat pumps out to the communities on the east side. Um, and uh, we started this partnership um, talking and working with Spark Northwest, which is a local nonprofit. And they really encouraged us, and we really heard the message, and they said, we'll work with you, but you really have to have an equitable access for heat pumps. And we really embraced it. And so from the get-go, we've done that. And so we've been able to um, establish other relationships with the King County Housing Authority, and I'm going to report more on that probably in the spring when that Imagine Housing Kirkland Plaza project is done that I'm really, really excited about. Um, but we've also strengthened relationships in the community with a great human service provider, HopeLink. They're going to be helping us with the Energy Smart Eastside campaign. And all of this great collaboration has led to the Eastside Climate Partnership Interlocal Agreement, which you know about. Um, it's going to allow us to do so much more together. The east side cities really enjoy working together, and there's a lot of economy and scale and financial benefits to working together. So that is the energy supply and emissions. Oops. Um, in the building and infrastructure section, um, I know that you're aware that we adopted high performing building codes this year, or in 2022. And um, obviously, the station area plan, taking those high-performing codes and like rolling them into the station area, station area plan was great, because now we're going to be able to see that um, playing out in action in the station area. Um, the other area where we're going to be able to see this happen, high-performing codes, is in our volunteer pro voluntary um, high-performing program, which we're expanding from just single-family homes to all building types, and additions and alterations because an important aspect of uh, building um, decarbonization, electrification, electrification is working with existing buildings and housing stock. But the story here is, is that all of these um, um, codes and these plans rely on third-party verification of attainment of a performance standard. And I think the, the really important, impactful um, um, thing that I want to get across is, is that it's one thing to say you've done something. It's another to have a third party look at your performance and verify it and then report out that you achieved it. So I'm really pleased that our station area, our high performing codes and our voluntary programs are using this third party mechanism. Um, under the land use and transportation, I mean, this picture says it all, the station area. This is a living version of sustainability being acted out in Kirkland. And um, you know, you've got things um, like exhibiting um, smart growth. You've got um, you know, future housing near high capacity transit and, and jobs near that transit. Um, you've got you know, identifying um, areas where you can expand the active transportation network. Um, it's, it's like a living laboratory. Um, and last but not least, you know, this will give us and we'll be able to encourage people to um, use other modes of transportation besides um, driving a single occupancy vehicle. So I'm really excited to see um, how the plan um, plays out and also its intersection with the sustainability master plan. 
and on the natural environment ecosystem, um, you know, city staff is always doing amazing stuff to protect the environment and enhance the environment um, um, every day. Um, what I'd like to really highlight here is some of the data-driven decisions that we're making now. And so now that we have new tools, we're able to do things um, like look at where our trees are and where people live. Um, we all know that people in Kirkland really value and appreciate trees, you know, whether it's on our streets, whether it's in our trails, whether it's in our parks. Um, the beauty of now the merging of the data and the, um, you know, this, this information of where people live is it allows us to equitably distribute the environmental benefits that we're seeking to um, have the entire community enjoy. And although this map talks about, you know, the orange is where there's low tree cover and also priority populations live, so now we know. Um, but there's also tons of other applications that the, you know, we haven't even conceived yet, but we're starting to. So I'm really excited about that. And that's, this is something you're gonna see us working on in 2023 and beyond. Under sustainable materials management, um, you know, we wanna see more of the second picture, which is deconstruction, and less of the first picture, which is demolition. Um, and so the great news is, is that we have um, several divisions in the city that are actually gonna tackle that this year. And it's really important um, from an impact standpoint, less um, in, um, materials that don't need to be in a landfill. Um, also all the embodied carbon that exists in valuable building materials, when you're demolishing it, it's going bye-bye. When you're deconstructing it, it can be repurposed and, and used as salvage or in new buildings. Um, there's just a tremendous amount of uh, materials in, in these buildings that are being demolished. Um, I should also note that we're not gonna start from scratch. Um, King County has a great model ordinance that we will tailor to meet Kirkland's needs. Um, thank you, King County. Um, and um, I think this is really important to note that, you know, why this, why having a deconstruction ordinance and, and a deconstruction program is important is because, you know, Kirkland um, demolishes about close to 300 structures a year. So if you think about that, if we have a different mechanism, it's really great for the environment. Um, on the sustainable business um, focus area, um, a lot of time and attention was um, spent getting the ARPA recovery funds out to the business community so they could have websites, they could figure out how to do um, you know, transactions to people during a time when they're trying to survive, and that was fantastic work that's been done. Um, what I wanna talk about here is green jobs. So I don't know if you've ever heard this, where are the green jobs? The green jobs are here, they are in installing heat pumps, they are installing you know, solar panels, they're um, installing air source heat pump water heaters, um, charging stations, all that kind of stuff. Here's the issue. The issue is the jobs are here, but we don't have all the people to do the jobs. So maybe um, perhaps one of the things that we consider over the next few years is working in an economic development realm, maybe regionally, to either attract more green businesses here and also work with the local um, educational facilities to um, get more people to do these jobs. These are family wage, decent paying jobs that do not require a degree. So anyway, hopefully we'll, we'll explore that. Um, under the sustainable governance realm, um, you know, it's always really important when you're exhibiting leadership to look at yourself first not to say you do this, you do this, you do this. And the one thing that I can tell you for sure, and I know you know this, is Kirkland looks at itself first. Um, and over the years, we've done things like um, expanding our EV, um, our electric vehicle fleet. Um, and we're, we're you know, installing, we've installed chargers um, here. Um, we have public charging stations um, here at City Hall and throughout the city. And um, a really great thing is, is that we are um, powering that all from renewable energy from our green direct contract. So that's something that the community will also eventually have um, in the future when we implement the Clean Energy Transformation Act. Um, and also uh, we, um, our fleet for the cars that aren't electric, we um, actually have a new administrative policy that is um, 
telling people not to idle their cars and it saves a tremendous amount of pollution. And by doing this with our fleet and our charging stations, we're reducing our carbon emissions. On the healthy community um, focus area, um, I love this. I, I love looking at what the um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging um, plan is doing. And I also love how it is kind of interacting with the SMP, the Sustainability Master Plan. And um, in talking um, with our um, DEIB team, um, it, it's pretty clear that we have some opportunities and over the next few years, um, there's a few actions that I've listed here um, to look at things like expanding our leadership development, um, getting our Welcoming America certification, considering things like a mobile pop-up um, cultural center, love it. Um, and then strengthening our community relationships, you know, establishing a proactive network of civically underrepresented community members. So um, I'm looking forward to some really great impactful actions um, and working with our DEIB um, staff. And last, I'm gonna finish with community initiatives. I love this. It's um, really clear and I know the Green Kirkland Partnership it gets all of us together out there doing things the community loves and cares so much about the environment. And there's so many great events and I, I, I've listed numbers about how many trees we planted, but I, I'd be remiss not to mention them. Also wanted to point out that I'm leading the environment element um, comp plan update. So I'm gonna be looking um, for the surveys that we're gonna be sending out recent, or in the next few weeks. Um, and also the focus groups, finding out where the intersection of sustainability and what people want to see, what people want us to do, what they want to do, um, and then kind of reinforcing that with the comp plan update. Um, also, our amazing sustainability ambassadors, students, um, um, you know, working with them has been a joy and mentoring and learning. I'm learning from them. I'm, I'm sure that we all are. Um, and also looking forward to reading their reports, which I'll get to you um, tomorrow. They've got like five reports that I can send to you to the council email address. Um, really cool thing that happened um, last year is, is that we had this community-led anti-idling um, campaign that you've heard about. Um, so now we're intersecting the, um, the folks that brought that to you, and they're gonna be tabling at the um, Bicycle Town Hall on April 22nd. So we're coming full circle on all this stuff and repurposing all the great materials that you helped them purchase um, so that it could have new life. And last but not least, um, just you know what you can expect for um, in the coming year is um, more quarterly updates showing all the great work from staff on the SMP, um, more Energy Smart Eastside webinars, um, we're having actually a um, uh, King County Library um, Systems having one on March 8th, which will be in the TWIC um, soon, um, so that you'll see that. We're really trying to explain that there's money out there from no matter what income level you are to pay for these great energy improvements. Um, so hopefully we're gonna see more um, low-income uh, uh, heat pump installations through our strategic partnerships. Um, you know, more intersection with the SMP and the comprehensive plan update, um, and also more community education about environmental concerns. And hopefully um, it, this fall, we'll, we'll see a carbon emissions report um, for you to enjoy. So that's my report. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Questions, comments? Councilmember Black. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, well, uh, two comments. One, David, just thanks for all your work and leadership within the uh, city uh, on the uh, climate action and sustainability master plan. Uh, great presentation, and I uh, really appreciate your devotion uh, to this work for, on behalf of the city. Um, you did. I, I loved what you mentioned about green jobs, and when you said it, the first thing I thought of was uh, Lake Washington Tech, uh, not just their Bachelor of Applied Science programs, uh, but also their high school uh, program, Lake Washington Technical Academy, I think, um, and there that seems to that that seems to be a ripe uh, possibility for uh, uh, coordination um, and synergy 
um, with the job training and job d development for green jobs. So hopefully that, that's on your radar and that's when you're talking about these next steps with respect to green job development and training, hopefully they're, uh, they're somebody we're talking to. They could, they could be out ahead of us already, but just finding out what they're up to would be great. So, Thank you, and we are. Perfect. Sure. Thank you. Yep. That's it. Super. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. And that might be something that you could discuss with Mike <clears throat> at Cascade as well. Okay. In terms of approaching Lake Washington, or, yeah, Elwood. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That takes us to item number eight, our consent calendar. Before we have a motion, I'd like to ask Deputy Mayor Arnold to present the audit of the accounts. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We had payroll in the amount of $3,788,760.05 and bills in the amount of $3,478,224.15. Thank you. Can I get a motion to approve the consent so moved. agenda? Second. And Moved by Councilmember Falcone, seconded by Councilmember Pascal. Any discussion? Councilmember Nixon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> well, I note that the consent calendar tonight includes an update to an extension of our contract with the city manager. Um, in my humble opinion, we have the best city manager in the state and probably in the country, and we want him to stay. <laughs> Uh, it will be my pleasure to vote in favor of that contract extension as part of tonight's consent agenda. Um, also, I would like to once again uh, compliment our city clerk and our public records staff for their excellent performance. Um, I am now president emeritus of Washington Coalition for Open Government, uh, but I'm still on all the coalition email lists and see a lot of email on social media about uh, public records complaints from all around the state. I do not hear anything there about Kirkland. Um, and the performance report on tonight's consent agenda tells us why. Uh, in the last six months of 2022, uh, they processed nearly 2,000 public records requests expeditiously and efficiently, kept up with the workflow, and that's all because of the great processes we've established and the people who run those processes. And so thanks very much to Kathy and the rest of the public record staff for their exemplary work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Nixon. And I think every single one of us <coughs> echo both of your sentiments this evening. With that, I have, a, I have the question is on the motion to approve the consent calendar moved by Councilmember Falcone, seconded by Con Councilmember Pascal. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, this takes us to our business agenda. And item A on our business agenda is the health through housing agreements discussion. City Manager. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Madam Mayor. So tonight is not a decision night, but we are looking for feedback. Uh, we're gonna be checking in with you on uh, the health through housing agreements that we're working on with King County and we'll be presenting you with where we are on every issue except the issue of background checks and screening, which we'll be bringing to the March 7th council meeting. Uh, so here to give you that presentation is Jim Lopez, our Deputy City Manager for External Affairs, also supported by Darcy, Eiler, Darcy Eilers, who's our Assistant City Attorney, who's been working really hard on this with King County and Jim as well. Welcome both of you. Thank you very much. There we go. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Deputy Mayor and Council. It's really my pleasure to be here before you tonight to talk about the Health Through Housing program and our update. I do like to echo the thanks to Darcy Eilers and Adriana Campbell and David Walbrook for their assistance tonight on this presentation and on this good work. And I'd also like to recognize Kelly Ryder here from the county, one of the part of the county leadership team. Thank you very much for coming tonight, Kelly. Uh, tonight um, is an update, uh, an important update on uh, several um, items that have been important to both the county and the community. I got it. So um, these three kind of areas of interest are areas that we've been working on with the county in preparation for what we hope will be in March the opportunity to bring to the council everything you need to know to make an informed decision 
on this project. These three important items we've been working closely with the county on because they, we have interpreted them to be both council and county uh, community questions and priorities that we've gleaned from our outreach on this process. We're about a year in, March is the um, anniversary uh, for Resolution 5522, which has guided our work uh, through the summer where we had comprehensive community outreach into the fall, and then in the fall and the winter we had a lot of negotiation. So we now feel we're, we're getting to the point where on, Mar on March 7th we can come to you with that information, potentially for a decision on March 21st. So these three important areas involve both the code of conduct and we're spe thinking specifically of off-premises behavior. Councilmember Nixon has raised this issue. I think Councilmember Black asked us specifically to do some research on this issue. We also have information uh, on staff's recommendation to add a city liaison requirement to support community relations. 5522 did not go that far. We're based on community input and what we're hearing about the need for connectivity with the city to this project and perhaps even appending a schedule of community meetings for local um, community members and institutions close to this facility, it might be coupled with a, a city liaison. And also some update on a deadly weapon prohibition. Members of our community, particularly the school, had written to the council about this issue. I compliment the county for dealing directly with the school and the community on this issue and we'll give an update on that work. And like I say, we are expected to come back in March. We're not going to talk about screening criteria tonight. Uh, we are going to uh, hopefully come to you with some comprehensive information in March, March 7th, and also the work on a local referral network. So much that we've learned, the linchpin of success of this project uh, will rely so much on the ability to refer into this network, into this program, and we, we hope to have some really good information for you on March 7th about that. So I'd like to begin the brief presentation with this graphic. We used it in the last meeting, and there's a lot of complexity, and I think this graphic helps bring some simplicity to the complexity. The graphic also shows, I believe, unprecedented collaboration with the county. That box in green, the permanent supportive housing agreement, and the services agreement, this model services agreement, we basically created as part of this process. And we did that so that we could push as much information to the city council and the community as we can early in the process so that they could see what the relationship, the terms and conditions of the relationship. And the reason why we did that was to show how resolution 5522 comes to life through these two agreements. Um, as you move through the process, that's what we're doing now. We're, we're asking the council ultimately for approval of the permanent supportive housing agreement, which is an agreement directly between the city and the county, and a model services agreement, which would be an agreement between the operator and the county that would be substantially similar to what you approve. Once that's done, the next step would be for the county to select an operator of which the city of Kirkland would participate and concur. And then this last grouping, the code of conduct, it's kind of like an alphabet soup of plans. The code of conduct, the community relations plan, the safety and security plan, the county's own good neighbor agreement, not to confuse things because some of this could be merged. This all happens according to the normal county timeline after the operator is selected. So a lot of what we're talking about with the county in our negotiations is uh, where the language we potentially agree to lives. Does it live upstream in the permanent supportive housing agreement or services agreement, model agreement, or does it live downstream where it usually lives in the county process in these various very important plans? Uh, tonight's discussion mostly uh, uh, involves the upstream permanent supportive housing agreement, although I will say we continue to work with the county on these issues to try to um, work through their preference to have the language move downstream into the various plans. So I hope that's clear in the graphic. Good. Okay, so for council review tonight, <clears throat> we have to address the issue of 
both on-site and off-site conduct, we have been working on language that would uh, impact uh, the resident of the facility's behavior. And the language that we have kind of gleaned, and this is city language, it is not agreed to with the, with the county, although we have sent it to the county and they're evaluating it, uh, we would expect something substantially similar to expectations of occupant behavior in the immediate and surrounding area. So this would address Councilmember Nixon's question, I think two presentations ago. No interfering with neighbors, business vendors, street cleaners, or emergency responders, and no behavior that disrupts the rights of persons living, working, or visiting the area. I would like to say, and we did, Councilmember Black, do some follow-up research, some follow-up legal research, I would like to say that the Fair Housing Act does apply here, the Landlord-Tenant Act as well, and those laws are going to be very protective by their nature. They, they only really consider material breaches, and the, I think the burden is high to begin with should, you be, should the operator be uh, considering some kind of more aggressive action like eviction. So there is this fundamental premise of protections in the um, uh, Landlord-Tenant Act, but given that, I think we wanted to make sure that somewhere in these documents, we are being responsive to the council and the community by referencing both uh, language that governs or touches upon both on-site and off-site conduct. Madam Mayor, maybe I should stop there. I could go through all three uh, and then take comment. I look to you for guidance. How would you prefer? One at a time. One at a time. Somebody, somebody thought it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <I have> <laughs> thank you. you. Ready to go ahead then? Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Jim, and thank you for the visual. You know, I need that. Um, Mike. Oh, no, it was on. I'm, I had that happen this morning when I was testifying. Um, thought I turned it on. Anyway, thank you for the visual. My question I have a couple questions, and I one is per pertinent to this. But after the operator selected, then we go through the process of creating those other documents, but do we also then finally begin the process of doing the necessary construction work on the property? I just kind of want to know like what happens when and when, when in the process do we start uh, evaluating who will be future residents and so forth. So I'm hoping that when you come back in March, you could talk about that. We, we absolutely could. Thank okay. you. And I think it's concurrent, but I think they could do them both at the same time. That's what I'm hoping. Yep. So, and thank you for identifying Kelly. I didn't recognize her with the mask on. So hello, thank you for coming. I'll just look for the thumbs up or the thumbs. <laughs> yeah. No, I shouldn't speak for Kelly, but I believe that in another meeting I was with, with her that they're going to start the construction part of the aspect before we're in operator selection. Okay. So and then those will sort of be running together okay, as well. Good. That's what I'm hoping, that everything isn't sequential. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to this. Um, this language, I, I understand our objective. This language is a little squishy for me. Um, no interfering with neighbors, business vendors, street cleaners. I'm not sure why street cleaners was elevated to an issue. I stay away from street cleaners. Um, <laughs> And, and no behavior that disrupts the rights of a person living, working, and visiting the area. Frankly, my neighbors could say that I'm interfering with them based on if I put my trash cans in their parking spot or so forth. So I, I'm not sure that this is specific enough to address the concerns that we have, that potential concerns we have. Um, there is language in the other good neighbor agreement that talk specifically about threatening or unsafe behavior is not allowed. I think that is closer to what we're trying to achieve. This feels like, um, again, it's too vague, and how would it be enforced? Like, are we going to get a crazy amount of phone calls because there's a perception of interference? So I, I just think we have some more work to do here. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Council Mayor Falcon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, I'm glad I let Council Mayor Curtis go first because I had that same question was my <laughs> first question. Although I like your word squishy. I think I told the city manager earlier that it was broad and unclear, I think were my um, words I used earlier. Yeah, I, I had that same same 
concern um, about that, so I won't repeat it. Um, but a follow-up question to that that I had, and this is perhaps um, a question for King County. Um, Kelly, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, is what happens in the hopefully very rare instance where somebody is evicted from a health or housing facility, in, the, in this case, in this health or housing facility, does King County then um, guarantee them a spot in another health or housing facility? Is there um, another um, alternative for individuals who, um, who may be evicted? I just would, would wanna be clear on what that plan is. I'm sure that that's something that King County has thought through or is thinking through, because it wouldn't just um, obviously be relevant to this facility. But I think we all care about um, the neighbors, the neighborhood, and also the residents of this facility and ensuring that um, whatever concerns they are, that they aren't just magnified by, um, by unhousing somebody um, who's just been housed. So thank you. We do have that question. We could come back on the 7th or I leave it up to you, Kelly, if you want to address. That. Okay, we will, we will address. We'll work with the county on a more kind of detailed, perhaps flow chart as to how that works. Great. Thank you. Great, any further discussion? Go ahead, Jim. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving on to the next issue. This issue addresses specific concerns. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I was too quick on the draw. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Councilmember Black. Or I was too slow on the draw. <laughs> um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I, uh, I wasn't going to speak to this uh, uh, specific question uh, coming into today's meeting, but since um, because Councilmember Curtis and Councilmember Falcone have raised this, is it does have me thinking about uh, this language. And it also has me thinking about, because um, some this some of this language reads a little bit like creating a nuisance. Um, and I do think we need to be cautious. The, the, the penalty for creating a nuisance in your neighborhood is not that you lose your home. Um, there are remedies, but they're not the loss of your home, whether you're a single family homeowner um, or whether you live in a multi, uh, multi-family uh, facility, um, whether you're a renter or whether you're an owner, the remedy is not a uh, loss of, your, of a roof over your head. So um, I would like us, I think, I think what I'm saying is, I think I'm agreeing with Council Member Curse. it might be good <clears throat> to tighten this up a little bit so that it's not the same, basically a definition that is, is so broad that it basically can comprise a nuisance. I really like the idea of, um, from what I've heard and what I know the staff has been uh, talking about and struggling with, and I know uh, based on what Council Member Nixon's, his comments from a couple of presentations ago, I like the idea of sort of creating harm, creating unsafe, mm -hmm. um, uh, actually risking uh, people's uh, neighbor's life and limb. Uh, but I don't necessarily want this, or this is my opinion, I wouldn't want this to be so broad as to basically have the remedy for creating a nuisance be you lose your home. Because uh, I don't think that's the context anywhere else in our society. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now you may proceed. Thank you. Um, so the next issue to address the specific concerns about ensuring the city's direct involvement. We've heard this in different, it's been manifested in different ways. One idea was to, and I think um, um, Stuart's here tonight, and thank you for all your work on this, Stuart. Uh, some ideas about creating a community advisory board or a community advisory council, that's been an idea that's been presented. Um, this, I, this idea of a city liaison is kind of born out of that response that the city would appoint um, a city staff person, which isn't in 5522, to attend meetings with the facility and the community so that it would ensure our direct involvement in both kind of the ongoing communication and it does, I think, relate a little bit to the ongoing performance of the facility and making sure that our hopes and expectations are being lived up to. Uh, the city manager has graciously identified an FTE. I still do need to speak to the parks director on that. Um, but. Uh, but I think we can incorporate this into our existing work program. One of the very interesting uh, 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 things that we could append to this is working with the county to create a schedule of community meetings. I don't know that we need a community advisory structure to create community meetings. And I think if I'm understanding correctly, the county has done this successfully with other communities where there's a lot of energy at the beginning and the city staff would be there and the community would be there, but if things are doing well, 
a year or two down the road, there's less need, and, and the goal is to kind of uh, hopefully have attendance taper off because people feel it's such a well-run facility. So those are some of the ideas that we're thinking about uh, with respect to this, and we wanted to bring that to your attention. Go ahead. Are you sure? Yeah. Um, I just want to say I strongly support this idea. I think it's a great solution. I think that it's the city's responsibility that people have somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the idea of using the homeless outreach coordinator, the fact that that person lives in um, the parks department is a good thing because this person will not only be the liaison to the community when there are issues or complaints or concerns, but they also will be the liaison to the residents and to the operator and will be able to facilitate um, <clears throat> some community connections. Um, because we have had community members say that they want to volunteer or they want to provide some sort of service to the community or doing a welcoming party. So I see this as a two-way street and very promising. Thank you. I'm going to just agree with you very strongly. What what I see this uh, is as it, I see this is what's missing right now in our relationship with some of the attained facilities. Um, so I think having a, a direct connection is going to make a significant difference, and we might want to look at how that works across uh, our relationships uh, with homeless. Providers. Uh, Councilmember Falcon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I also think this is a good idea. I think, interestingly, it really speaks to kind of the intersection of housing and homelessness as okay. well, that it's a um, homeless outreach coordinator that we're um, proposing here. Um, given that this is will be a new position in the city, I just would want us to just um, keep an eye on workload here and make sure we're prioritizing time and um, that we're making sure that, that helping those who are unhoused is top priority um, for that position. But aside from that, yes, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, thank you for that. Go ahead, Jim. Okay, so moving on to the third issue. This issue, we're actually very, very grateful uh, for the county to take the lead on this issue. This issue came through, I believe, the EPS, uh, the... Um, the school that's located in that area wrote a letter, and one of the uh, concerns they had was about deadly weapons, including firearms. What, what I believe the county to have done is to reach out directly to the school to discuss that issue with them, and our understanding is, this is a little bit beyond the scope of the city's authority for various reasons, but our understanding is that the county operates do prohibit deadly weapons, including firearms. You know, I think they do this in their capacity as the the owner of the property or the landlord of the property. So we've kind of left this conversation to the county with the community and we've, we've kept close um, tabs on it to see where it might fit in our constellation of, of documents and we're, we're comfortable with the communications the, counties is the county is making about how they included in their lease agreements and the like. And we've kind of just basically felt uh, gratitude that we're being responsive to the community and with an expectation that the result will be uh, acceptable. Great work. I did add one more, Madam Mayor. Council Member Curtis, I think at the end, we listened to the, to the um, council meeting feedback last time, and there was some talk to ensure our performance measures were both um, Dil you know, we were diligent in making sure that the program lived up to its aspirations, but very cognizant to include positive performance measures about how we're hoping to change lives. So we did add uh, a couple of things. We're working with the county. They ha the county has evaluators and they have an infrastructure set up to do this, so we want to be respectful of that. But we did put percentage of residents receiving job training and who secure employment as these concepts. We basically just kind of transposed what you said or transcribed it. And I think we could work with the county to make that happen in the context of what they already do. But uh, we wanted to make sure that you know we're being responsive for that. So um, that's my 10 slides. Um, I would say uh, we do hope to have a big meeting on March 7th. Like I say, we hope to come to you to bring both uh, all the information you need to make the decision about the screening process. We hope to bring you information about the local referral network, which we're excited about. 
and any other information we think is material to the city council um, potentially kind of landing this plane in the month of March, maybe even March 21st, although that would ultimately be up to the council. Okay, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Darcy. Um, and thank you, Kelly, for joining us today. Thank you. Takes us to item B, the 2023 state legislative update. Number three. Oops, Diana's on screen. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, city manager. Okay, Jim, did you log out? Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, Madam Mayor. So as you said, this is our legislative update number three, and Diana Hart, our government relations manager, will provide that presentation. And we're here to answer questions and any comments the council has about the legislature so far. Welcome, Diana. Uh, good evening, Council. I um, hope everything's displaying correctly. Um, tonight we have our third legislative update. We'll get started with the same three prior um, topics we discussed at our last meeting with a little more detail. Uh, starting with our legislative calendar. Today is day 44 of the 105 day long session. We've passed the first cutoff with the policy committee cutoff last Friday. With almost 1,600 bills introduced so far, 1,108 have been identified as passing cutoff deadline. We'll likely see another big chunk of bills die this Friday with the passing of the fiscal committee cutoff. And then the legislature will head to the floor over the next week and a half or so for um, before the House of Origin cutoff. A little uh, detail as to what that means for the bills that the city is tracking. Uh, we were uh, following 325 bills. That number is now down to 231. Some of those policies to not make the cutoff include tenant protections, firearm regulations, battery stewardship, state building code council, multifamily tax exemption, vehicular pursuits, behavioral health support, equity and growth management act, list goes on. Not to say that the companions or other versions of these policies aren't still alive, and some of these bills that are currently identified as dead may come back to life under the necessary to implement the budget provision. So that takes us to an update of how it's going this session. Starting with the housing-focused legislative priorities, Senator Cooter's version of the accessory dwelling unit bill that we're um, sponsoring this year has made it out of both the policy and fiscal committees and is now sitting in rules ready to be pulled to the floor. Representative Klobuchar's version of the ADU bill made it out of the policy committee and when I made the when I finished this presentation earlier um, it was a waiting schedule in the fiscal committee as with many things in the legislature as soon as you hit print everything is out of date. That was fortunately the same for um, this bill as we now have a public hearing and executive session scheduled for tomorrow. Representative Chop's REIT bill had its public hearing in the fiscal committee this morning with council member Curtis testifying in support. As expected, this bill is receiving strong opposition from the realtors, but we found our message about the magnitude of funding that um, this policy could raise for local governments to be quite compelling in our conversations with legislators last week at the AWC City Action Days. Following up on the other items on our priority agenda, um, start, starting off with the bills we signed in support since our last meeting um, related to housing, we had a couple bills um, consolidating local permit review processes, affordable housing program funding options, transit oriented development, under behavioral health, we had two bills, one related to controlling substance possession and treatment, and then behavioral health support specialists. Under sustainability, we had a handful of bills um, focusing on battery product stewardship, clean energy economy, economy labeling of residential buildings, updating the integrated climate response strategy. Under reproductive rights, we had a bill prohibiting cost sharing for abortion. Under the general principles, we had three bills, um, pedestrian safety, transportation impact fees for bicycle and pedestrian facilities, and then a tax increment financing technical fix bill. And under the newly added property tax cap um, provision that we added at the meeting, at your last meeting, we had both the House and Senate version to raise the cap. These bills are not companions, but um, they both seek to um, raise the 1% to a 3%. Um, the mayor also testified on the wrap 
Act for product stewardship, and uh, we did not sign in opposed to any bills. This now gives us back to a quick discussion. Um, want to flag as I did last week or last meeting that the bill trackers stated position in the packet is the recommended position by the legislative work group and is considered acknowledged by council after this discussion, unless you want to pull any out for further conversation. I did want to flag one um, bill that was raised during um, our legislative delegation meetings last week, and that's House Bill 1474 or Senate Bill 5496, the companions, which um, the bill title, creating the covenant home ownership account and program to address the history of housing discrimination due to racially restrictive real estate covenants in Washington state. Long titles, almost as long as the list of 44 co-sponsors it has in the house. Um, this bill utilizes an increase in the document recording fee to fund a new account to financially support individuals acquiring homes that have historically been restricted from securing housing due to real estate covenants like redlining. The document recording fees and real estate excise tax or REIT are two revenue raising tools that often receive a great amount of criticism from realtors as they raise the cost of selling real estate. Realtors typically are strongly against um, increases to both of these tools. However, they are coming out in strong support of the covenant homeownership bill or homeownership account bill due to the corresponding program to begin undoing the impacts of racial housing discrimination. I flag this for the group as it is a very uncommon for the legislature to increase document reporting fees and REIT in the same year. And the legislature may focus its efforts behind this proposal over our REIT 3 proposal due to the realtor support and difficulty in raising both revenue sources. Um, and with that, turn things back to you for discussion and conversation. Happy to answer any questions that you have. We'll start with our chair, uh, Councilmember Curtis. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Diana, and thank you, Team AWC. It was a very worthwhile trip to Olympia last week, and every time we leave, we get such a warm reception from our legislators, and every time we leave, they tell us how wonderful Kirkland is and how proud they are of us, so we should be proud. Um, so I just want to follow up on Diana's presentation on SHB 1474. There's a public hearing tomorrow, and because it was not included in the packet, I need your permission to go ahead and sign in pro on this bill. Um, it is, as Diana said, it does have realtor support. We think this bill is going to move forward. Personally, my fingers are crossed also on the REIT 3 bill. Um, but there's no downside to us supporting this bill, so I need a head nod, thumbs up to support it. Thank you, everyone. All right, Councilmember Nixon, did you? Okay, great. Okay, any other discussion? Yeah. Councilmember Nixon. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I was contacted earlier today uh, by someone in the industry, and this was actually kind of in my washcog role, but it intersects with um, what we're doing uh, in the city. It had to do with House Bill 1131, and this is the product responsibility bill that would support local government recycling efforts. Um, it creates two different organizations, a producer responsibility organization and a distributor responsibility organization. That, that would be made up of industry representatives, but empowered to effectively create state policy. They would establish all the rules by which these programs operate, um, and they would be mandatory rules. Um, uh, and I believe that those rules should be developed fully in, in the sunlight, um, observable by the industry and by the public. Um, the original bill, House Bill 1131, did that, but when the bill was exact out of committee, the substitute House bill removed those provisions, which one could certainly interpret as meaning those organizations would be able to operate entirely behind closed doors, which I personally would object to. And I think all of us would like to see that kind of important work be done in a way that we can all observe it. Um, and so I wanted to ask if, if we would support asking staff to follow up on that issue and bring us back some information so we can decide whether this is something that we should um, address in further testimony as the bill moves through the process. I think we've got head nuts up. Yes, let's do that thing. 
<laughs> okay. What he uh, said. Yeah. <laughs> Diana's right there. She's got it. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Thank you, Diana. You're doing a great job. Uh, this takes us to item number C, personal delivery devices. City Manager. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. So we are checking in with you on changes we have made at the personal delivery device ordinance since we last spoke. We're hoping it is ready for final action tonight, but if you have further questions or amendments, we're here to answer them. And so here to give you that short presentation is our Public Works Deputy Director, John Starboard. Welcome, John. Here we are with your favorite subject. <laughs> yes, who would have known? Um, so uh, the... the uh, Council and the city have discussed this item for now 13 months, so I'll respect that uh, the council remembers the history of this matter and uh, recalls the path that led us to tonight. Staff has before you two proposed ordinances. Um, one concerns allowing personal delivery devices to operate on private property only, and that ordinance concerns amendments to the zoning code. The other ordinance would be for operation of personal delivery devices on the public rights of way. And uh, that ordinance would encompass amendments to the municipal code. Um, the council could adopt one or both of those ordinances. Uh, the council also has the option of disallowing personal delivery devices uh, in the city. There is not an obligation to have them uh, operate uh, in Kirkland. The ordinance concerning private property and the amendments to the zoning code is the same as was presented in uh, July of 2022. It, it hasn't changed. Uh, the ordinance concerning operation on the rights of way uh, was presented to you the last time on January 3rd. Uh, there is a chart in your staff report that identifies the recommended amendments that came from the council and a reference to the sections in the ordinance. There's also a chart that identifies recommended, recommended changes to the right-of-way ordinance from the Washington City's Insurance Authority. And similarly, there are references to the uh, proposed amendments by section there. Um, uh, Your Honor, I would be uh, happy to try to answer uh, any questions or address any issues the council has. Thank you, John. Any questions or discussion? Uh, Deputy Mayor Arnold. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to move Ordinance 4826. Second. It's been moved by Deputy Mayor Arnold, seconded by Council Member Black. Um, discussion? Council Member Nixon. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I had a, an email exchange with uh, staff earlier today and just wanted to uh, raise the issues here. Um, in Ordinance 4826, the one about operations on right-of-way, uh, the definition of a personal delivery device uh, starts out with the words, an electrically powered device. And so one presumes that this would include any form of propulsion that doesn't include combustion within the device, right? It uh, could be a battery power, which is what the ones were that we examined before. It could be solar power or it could be a fuel cell. <clears throat> but fundamentally, it doesn't involve combustion. Um, but it doesn't say that explicitly. Um, presumably, electricity via a long extension cord would not be acceptable. <laughs> um, but it, the language leaves unstated um, how devices with internal combustion engines would be treated. Uh, you could, in fact, make a PDD that had a gasoline engine or diesel or methane or propane or even combusted hydrogen. You could. Um, and it, it's not clear whether they are unregulated or whether they are prohibited from the way that the language is written. Um, our staff explained to me that the definition is directly quoted from state law, uh, which is why it is what it is. Um, so that's probably good to quote the state law, although we all know the state legislature gets it right the first time always. Um, uh, my preference would be to 
make these issues clear now. Um, uh, but I also recognize that um, if a question about these arose, when we, if we got an application for a gasoline-powered PDD, we could amend the code then to address that. Um, and we could also advocate for clarification of the state law itself in the next session. Maybe make that, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if it rises to the level of being a legislative priority, but it is, it is an issue for any city that wants to do this. Um, so what I thought I would do is rather than proposing an amendment uh, to the ordinances, to just ask a couple of questions so that we get our intent in the record. Um, so that the staff, in exercising their discretion and issuing permits in the future, would know what the intent was. So the first question I have for staff is, is it the city's intent that any internal source of electric energy is allowed? It has throughout the development of these ordinances, it's been um, contemplated that they would be um, they would be rechargeable battery powered. Um, and and staff did not contemplate the other kinds of energy sources that you identified a moment ago, like solar or fuel cells or those kind of things. But Correct. in in general, though, at least my feeling is that as the technology progresses, those would probably be just fine with us, right? If they wanted to have, say, a battery with solar panels on the top of the PDD that kept it topped up as it went through the neighborhood, that would be fine, right? Uh, my interpretation of the council's positions is that it doesn't want to have emissions. Right. Okay. So yes, I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. We can always ask the council or the council the same question if that if everybody agrees with that intent of any internal source of electricity is okay. Um, and the the complementary question is, um, can we confirm that it is not our intent that any combustion based energy source in the device uh, would be allowed? That those would actually be prohibited. Um, and, and, you know, if it's an electrical device and the combustion happened in Montana, we don't care about that. We care about what's happening in Kirkland. And so long as in Kirkland there's no combustion happening, we're okay. Uh, would you agree with that? If you're asking me, uh, Councillor Nixon, I, uh, staff does agree with that because along this process we have been uh, focused on electrically powered non-emission uh, producing uh, non-combustion energy source um, for these PDDs. And so the, the, the ordinance before us today um, is discretionary. It used to be kind of mandatory that if they met the requirements, we had to issue a permit. Now that's been changed based on WCIA's recommendation that it's discretionary. We may issue a permit. And so our intent would be if somebody came to us with a internal combustion engine based device, we would not issue that permit. Is that right? That's correct. That's the city manager says that's correct. <laughs> I got the intent in the record. City Thank you very much. City attorney agrees. <laughs> okay, with that, the question is on the motion uh, made by Deputy Mayor Arnold, seconded by Council Member Black uh, to adopt ordinance. Force eight two six. Uh, clerk, we call the roll. Councilmember Nixon. Yes. Councilmember Black. Yes. Councilmember Curtis. Yes. Councilmember Falcone. Yes. Councilmember Pascal. Yes. Deputy Mayor Arnold. Yes. Mayor Sweet. Yes. Um, the motion carries unanimously. Deputy Mayor Arnold. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to move Ordinance forty eight thirty six. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved by Deputy Mayor Arnold, seconded by Councilmember Black to adopt Ordinance 4836. Um, discussion? Uh, Deputy Mayor? Just, just briefly in summary, I really appreciate the work that staff's done to lean into this new technology and help find uh, solutions and figure out a pathway forward for the benefit of Kirkland and, and the community. We're balancing the 
needs of the public right of way, safety, and the evolution of this technology. We've tried to anticipate and be flexible. While the original impetus of this project uh, for discussion is stalled, the message is clearly for folks working on these new automation technologies. Come to Kirkland, try it out here. We'd love to love to support you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, question is on the motion to adopt Ordinance 4836. Moved by Deputy Mayor Arnold, seconded by Councilmember Black. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Curtis, er, Councilmember Nixon. Yes. Councilmember Black. Yes. Councilmember Curtis. Yes. Councilmember Falcone. Yes. Councilmember Pascal. Yes. Deputy Mayor Arnold. Yes. Mayor Sweet. Yes. Motion carries unanim unanimously. Thank you. This takes us to the next item, the 2023-24 work program. So just a quick check in. So it's probably about a 10 minute item, I believe. Do you want to take your break now? Or do you want to do this item first? Do we need a break? I think we're going to try and plug through. I just have to pull it up. One of us has to be on an airplane. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm beginning to learn that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. So this is our second discussion of the city work program. This is, as I'm calling, the revised work program, so the draft work program. Uh, the goal tonight is to get any final modifications to the work program itself or to the adopting resolution. And then presuming we get all that figured out, we'd be bringing it back for final action at the next council meeting. So what I did is I have simply put up the change language as you saw in the memo so that you can see the actual change in the resolution that's in the packet. The language is not shown in track changes, it's just presumed. So I thought I'd just go through each of the 12 items and see if the council agrees with the change which came from the study session or if there's any additional changes that you want to each element. So the element of the slides are also the same order as in the resolution itself. So. The first one, the council suggested adding the word council to a uh, task identified by the community, the council and the staff. So is there any questions or comments on that? Or, okay. Looks good. All right, thank you. All right, the second one is uh, we did capitalize North End Behavioral Health Clinic to make sure that its uh, significance is captured. And then added that we're doing this in partnership with King County and the state of Washington. Um, I just moved the in partnership to make it a little easier to read and highlight our partnership with the cities before we talk about King County and the state. So I'll see if this captured the council's comments. Looks good. Okay. Uh, so the third item, well, we added the council's intent to highlight that we also have the operation side of Fire Prop 1 and to make sure that we show people that we are completing the hiring and adding the enhanced levels of service from that ballot measure. So the underlying language is a completely new sentence that was added as a result of the study session. So any Great. questions or comments on that? Oh, Councilmember Curtis. Yeah, never mind. I'm waiting. She's you're waiting. All right. <laughs> okay. Thanks for joining. I would be in the same situation later, and maybe I misunderstood. I thought that we might be voting on approval of this resolution tonight, um, and so I also put my comments in the form of an amendment. Uh, but if we're not actually going to vote on it tonight, should we just go ahead and share our, our thoughts with the city manager so that they could be incorporated in the draft that would be coming to us at the next meeting rather than have formal amendments tonight? What do you think? Uh, I think you could do it either way. I think a motion approving the amendment to be included in the resolution might be the way to do it. So maybe the very last slide 
everything here is now captured in the resolution, so it probably would make sense to do the amendment to the resolution. Um, so if you moved the amendment, I could then incorporate it in what you see next um, at the March 7th meeting. If that works, but but it is there are changes, so I think they should maybe voted on. So just for discussion tonight. Yeah. Okay. Well, if the motion passes, then I would incorporate it in what you get next time. Okay. So then, are we going to need a motion on each one of these? I think so. I think that would that's the way I'd recommend it to communicate the full intent. Okay. Can you assume? So you need to go back. One, do we, okay. Can so I, I think get one, a motion? One of them is here, right? So I think this is council members Curtis's to change the word from oh, in Houghton. So you're suggesting that we we don't change the first two because we all nodded. Correct. Well, the this language is already in the resolution, so it's if you have any changes to what you're seeing on the screen. Okay. Yeah. So just anything you. that would change what's on the screen. Councilmember Curtis. You guys are protecting me from getting into parliamentary trouble. I sincerely <laughs> appreciate it. So I believe I'm making a motion on this work program item to include the word that the station, fire station 22 is in central Houghton, to be specific about the location of the fire station. Central Houghton neighborhood? No, I think central Houghton's good, because we're not calling out we're the We're not calling the rest of the, the neighborhoods other either. Okay. Mayor, are you looking for a second? Yeah. I'll second. Okay, moved by Council Member Curtis, seconded by Council Member Black. Discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, so if there's other amendment, you know, please stop me at that slide. So this one we added, the first sentence, prioritize retention and construction of attainable and diverse housing throughout the city. And the last sentence, monitor implementation through Kirkland's housing dashboard. So any... Council Member Curtis. Madam Mayor, um, I'd also like to make a motion to uh, amend this work plan item. The former La Quinta Inn is adjacent to Houghton. It's actually located in the Lakeview neighborhood. So I'd like to strike Houghton and add Lakeview instead. Second. Moved by Council Member Curtis, seconded by Council Member Falcone to change the language in whatever this is. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, our next multimodal transportation element was to add the 124th Avenue Northeast project. So that's the one change here. Just make sure that that reflected the council's request. Looks like thumbs up. Okay. All right, and then this was also the word and facilities was added uh, per council direction. So local transit service and facilities uh, to acknowledge it's more than just the service itself, but also the investments made in the roads and so forth. So uh, see if there's any other questions or comments on this item. Head nods. Excellent. <clears throat> there were no changes to this item at the January study session, but I just want to do one last check to see if there are any other questions or comments on the safe routes to school element. All right, seeing none, I will continue. Uh, there was also none to this item to attract and retain diverse employees and be a preferred employer. So just checking to see if there's any further questions or comments or suggestions on this one. I see none. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so this one was, uh, there was some additional discussion about this, so to implement priority parks, recreation, open space plan recommendations and continue development of park assets such as Four Blakes Park. And then the change from decide whether to place a ballot measure to place a ballot measure. Uh, this was not discussed, but I did as the city manager proposed the deletion of November 2023, uh, just to reflect the fact that we've heard now about the potential of a ballot measure from Evergreen Health, and I thought this might give you more flexibility, but that was something that I put in there, not something the council asked about, but I want to see if you have any changes to this element or my additional change. I think, I think this one looks all right. Okay, thank you. 
And then the nearly last one, uh, this one there was substantial discussion, and so I put some of the elements that were in the discussion, the housing element, which you've now approved, and then I um, added this language to capture the rest of it. So uh, basically putting the vision statement at the beginning of the sentence, complete the 2044 plan to maintain a sustainable, connected, welcoming community where everyone belongs, and added the sustainability master plan, the housing strategy plan, and missing middle housing codes per the council's discussion, and then also to update policies to attract and retain local businesses that support economic development and family wage jobs. This is good. So, any further comments? Okay, thank you. All right, I believe there might be a, a, a proposed amendment here. So this was the uh, completely new one that was proposed during the February retreat uh, that came out of the January 3rd discussion. Uh, this was the language you saw at the retreat. At that time, the council said to carry this forward into tonight's discussion. So this is basically the exact same language. The whole thing's underlined because it's new. So, Councilmember Nixon. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, well, in, in general, I don't support the addition of this uh, item to the work plan, mainly because I, I believe it's much less urgent than, than the other items in the work plan. And um, I, I recognize, though, that there is a desire to have a, a plank in the, in the work plan that specifically mentions sustainability. Um, and so I, I'd, I'd like to propose an amendment as a compromise, that, uh, rather than removing the plank entirely, that would strike the reference to climate justice, because I think that's vague and nonspecific, and um, also strike the, the clause about clean energy economy, which I believe is far beyond what we can accomplish as a single city. Um, and so with that, I would move the amendment that I sent out earlier today uh, that strikes the words prioritize climate justice and, and also strikes the words a clean energy economy that promotes. And so that would leave the words continue to fund sustainability master plan actions to further equity, energy efficiency, public health, and a sustainable and resilient environment to further the sustainable environment goal. That's a motion. Second. Moved by uh, Council Member Nixon, seconded by Council Member Arnold. Do you want to speak to that, Council Member? Or uh, Deputy uh, Mayor Arnold, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I think your point, Councilmember Nixon, on climate justice is well taken. Uh, we have um, a lot of detail in our sustainability master plan that I think we should stick to versus adding something else uh, as part of uh, our, our city work plans. I would uh, disagree with your comments on clean energy economy. Um, and would like to offer an amendment to maintain those words while, while keeping your initial comment to strike, uh, prioritize climate justice and. Second. It's been moved by Deputy Mayor Arnold, seconded by Council Member Falcone to um, modify the, well, to amend the amendment oh. as he just described. Further discussion? Councilmember Curtis? I also have a friendly amendment to the amendment to the amendment. Here I go. Oh. Getting myself in trouble. Point of order. <laughs> you can't amend yeah, an amendment to an amendment. Amend so we, we need to process the first amendment. But we haven't voted on your original amendment. No, that would hap hap happen. We, we am amend the amendment by voting on and then I'll uh, amend the mayors. The amendment and then you do the another order. amendment okay. to the amendment. Okay, see, there I go. <laughs> Okay, <coughs> question is on the motion. Yeah. Councilmember Black. Thank you, Madam Session? Mayor. Okay. Yeah, I'm speaking to the amendment. <laughs> and I, I actually, I, I, I think the points are well taken by both Councilmember Nixon and Deputy Mayor Arnold. Um, uh, in the end, I think that the sustainability master plan somewhat speaks for itself. And that was part of a, a lengthy multi-year, multi I think it was multi-year process of developing that sustainability master plan. So on principle, I'm actually okay with uh, the original amendment uh, because I think in the end, what we're stating is that as part of the city's work program, uh, we're gonna fund the sustainability ma uh, master plan um, and see um, and see it, uh, see it implemented and try to see its goals. 
So um, I'm going to I'm going to support. Uh, uh, I guess what I guess I'm, I'm going to say is, um, I'm going to uh, uh, vote no on the amendment because I think ultimately, as a matter of principle, the sustainability master plan speaks on its own. Okay. Any further discussion? Question is on the amendment to amend the language to uh, eliminate the climate justice but leave the clean energy econ economy. That's correct. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 How many is that? Stay opposed. Opposed? No. no. Is that a 4-3? Uh, motion does not carry. Wait a minute. No, it does doesn't. carry. It doesn't. Just carried. It Yay. Doesn't. Okay. <coughs> so now we go back to the original amended motion, or do we accept another amendment? You can second another amendment. Additional amendments to the amendment. All righty. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to amend, make a motion to amend the amendment in that um, I would like to retain the word prioritize so that it reads prioritize and continue to fund um, because we have action verbs in the start of most of our work plan items and again it says this is an important priority for us. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to leave the word priority prioritize in the amended amendment, amended amendment. Councilmember Nixon. Well, it would uh, also retain the word and. So basically, it would reduce the proposed amendment to just striking yeah, the words climate justice. justice. Correct. So prioritize and continue to fund sustainability master plan action. And I'm good with that. Okay. Question is on the amendment to the amendment. Uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Thank you. No. Oh, sorry. So we go back to the original amended amendment, which now reads, prioritize and continue to fund sustainability master plan actions to further equity, energy efficiency, public health, and a clean energy economy that promotes a sustainable and resilient environment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Thank you. That was mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, one last item. So as we discussed the last time, there was a considerable debate about whether or not to include a 25-26 budget item as an initiative. So uh, as I put in the memo, you could include it, you could not include it. I thought both arguments were logical. Um, another opportunity would be to move it into the operational value section. Mm. Um, and so I'm just looking for council direction on whether this should be in or not, or you want to include it somewhere else. It's currently in the proposal, so you'd have to tell me to take it out. This, this is Councilmember Nixon. So, do I was just going to scan through this. Do any are any of these other work plan items things that we would just automatically do in each biennium? No. Or are they all unique to immediate things? Yeah, I think they would all be considered immediate and um, unique things. And so even though preparing the next biennial budget is a major amount of work, it's not really any different than what we normally do. So I personally, I would be okay with leaving it out just to shorten up the document a little bit. It's not just, I would make a short sentence. If you go back through all of the ones that include the budget, I have had different language to emphasize some of the reasons why this budget's a little bit different or unique. So it isn't just always adopt a budget, but I think the point is we'll take it, we have to adopt a budget every time. Mm -hmm. and so the value is maybe that those sentences. So for example, you could choose that you don't care about a AAA credit rating, right? Or you could choose that, I mean, do. I wouldn't say it flippantly, but um, and so those are the kinds of things that you might, they give a little bit of policy direction when we talk about it, but. I think it can be easy. It can go either way and be supportable. Councilmember Black. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, I would, I'm all in favor of shortening this, but at the same time, this is the one where the budget doesn't speak for itself. Uh, we don't know what the priorities in the budget uh, for 25, 26, and this does signal to uh, to ourselves 
uh, and the community holds ourselves accountable uh, for these these specific elements and goals for the 25-26 budget. And for that reason, uh, because I do support these goals, um, I'm in favor of keeping it in there. Although, again, points are well taken both by the city manager and by Council Member Nixon. Any further discussion? Deputy Mayor Arnold. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And while I was the one who originally advocated for just making this a value, one of the things that convinced me that puts it kind of in the category of saying, no, this is going to take some work, was the financial management report that was in uh, our consent calendar talks about some level of uncertainty. And we're in an uh, environment with higher interest rates and slowing home construction. And so uh, while the city manager and council member Nixon's comments are that we're going to go do this anyway, I think having it in the work plan reflects the fact that it's going to take uh, some work to do so. I would agree. Councilman Nixon? Well, and I'll just say, I'm not going to move to strike it, and if nobody else is going to move to strike it, then it stays. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Is that okay. what you need? That is all I need. And then finally, <laughs> um, don't know if you had a chance to read like the whereas sections or if there's any other modifications to the body of the resolution itself. I'm happy to take those. Otherwise, we'll just bring it back for adoption as amended, and my suggestion is just place on the consent calendar on the March 7th council meeting. Good. Okay. okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. That takes us to item number 10. Um, reports. And I think I'll start with Council Mayor Nixon. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, I, I was going to make some comments about the uh, AWC City Action Days, but our legislative work group chair has already talked about that, and I'm sure she might say a few more words about that. But I did want to compliment the excellent work done by our staff, by our lobbyists, and by the legislative work group. It was a very well organized and very effective uh, opportunity for us to go to Olympia. Um, so thank you. Um, I also just wanted to mention that last Saturday evening, I was able to represent the city at the uh, centennial celebration, 100 year celebration of St. John's Episcopal Church in, in Kirkland and presented a commendation from the mayor, which was very well received, and they appreciated uh, the city taking part in that celebration. Thank you for doing that. Councilmember Lack. Uh, nothing to report. Councilmember Curtis. Nothing to report, but thank you, Councilmember Nixon, because I did want to thank staff for the hard work of really organizing this. It was a huge effort. I know we're spoiled. They're so good. <laughs> Councilmember Falcone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just have one item tonight. And it's a legislative request memo um, related to providing um, child care at city meetings and events. As a mom to three young children, I know firsthand how really challenging it can be to engage with our local government with kids in tow. I have three of them, so it can be a challenge. Um, and we've heard the same from many of our community members over the years. And uh, we've discussed this as a council, um, how child care is one of the many barriers to public participation in local government. Um, and you know, being able to attend meetings for the public, being able to serve on boards and commissions, being able to serve on council. I know that childcare is and continues to be a challenge for me personally as a council member, um, and likely even for staff who have to work evening and weekend meetings and events um, that may further their career and they may have to choose between um, incurring additional costs for childcare or attending that meeting. So. I would like to make a motion requesting a legislative request memo identifying options for a child care pilot for city public meetings and events. The LRM should prioritize options for a child care pilot at city council meetings first to inform how we might provide child care in other circumstances, such as at board and commission meetings, like I mentioned, um, and public outreach events, such as town halls, where we invite the public to, to, um, to meet with us and discuss issues with us. The LRM should also include issues to be explored, such as benefits um, for inclusion and belonging, as well as potential cost and liabilities associated with providing childcare. Second. Second. Moved by Councilmember Falcone, seconded by uh, Councilmember Pascal. Uh, the LRM as described. All those in favor, please, or any further discussion? Deputy Mayor. If you Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Curtis. Yeah, I know. 
Just, it, it's the eight o'clock testimony. That means I was up at six, I was getting ready, had a suit on at 7.30. Um, I will say that we are providing childcare at PFEC and it is being used and it adds to uh, the ability not only for the parents to attend the meetings, but it adds an opportunity for the children to see their parents serving their city. I think this is a great idea. Wonderful. Deputy Mayor Arnold. That may have um, answered part of my question. Part of the concern is, uh, well, a great idea. The way that you had described it seemed very big. The fact that we're already doing a piece of it right now maybe make it less big, but it certainly would... Um, Hope during the LRM process to talk about what um, I'm wondering if we could have options of if some of this gets too big, it becomes something that could be a mid by budget discussion or something like that. Because you covered public meetings, you covered benefits, um, things that seem beyond the scope of how we've handled LRMs at the, up to this point. So. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Council Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Well, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yes, I understand this definitely could turn into quite an endeavor, and we'd need to have that discussion as to what the level of investment is here based on prioritization with other things. Um, but it was very intentional to have this ask be for a, a pilot at first to really see how that would play out, and then we could learn from there and see how, if or how, we would want that to grow. Thank you. Um, Council Mayor Black. I uh, just quickly wanted to express my strong support for this idea. It's a big idea. It's an important idea. Um, it comes with a, it probably ultimately in its, in its uh, perfect form comes with a pretty huge fiscal note. Um, and so it probably, I, you know, I, uh, Deputy Mayor Arnold's comments are well taken that uh, we're probably, this is probably something that ult ultimately becomes a budget discussion. But I love that we're going to start, um, at least start looking into this because it's been a discussion we've had for uh, for a while now, um, and other communities are having. So um, thank you for raising it. Thanks. Thank you. Kels Bernick. Thanks. And I, I, list, I, I fully support this investigation as well. Um, uh, I was listening carefully to the things that you listed off, uh, Councilmember Falcone, and a couple things that I think need to be included in that are licensing requirements. Um, my My understanding is that you have to be licensed as a child care provider in Washington State. And so that might be a complexity if it was city employees providing the daycare as opposed to something that we could investigate, which is contracting this out to an entity that is already a licensed child care provider in the state. Um, and then the other thing that I think we ought to look at is I, I think the assumption is that this would be free and it certainly should be free for people who are low income. But there are a lot of folks who um, have the capacity to pay for the service, um, but it's simply not available at the right hours uh, for them to do so. Um, the daycare centers just aren't open. And so I think as part of the study, we should also look at um, the the ability to charge for the service for people who have the capacity to pay. Thanks. Okay. Okay, I think you have what you need. With that, I'll go to count. Oh, wait a minute. Question yeah, is we have to vote on the motion. I'm working on that. Uh, <laughs> question is on the motion to proceed with the LRM as described in this discussion, moved by Council Member Falcone, seconded by Council Member Pascal. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Councilmember Pascal. <laughs> you know, I don't have anything to report. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Arnold. I just wanted to note uh, the state of the city as uh, speech has happened, and uh, give our uh, thanks and and compliments to you on how well uh, uh, that went, and uh, appreciated uh, how you outlined all the work that. Uh, individual council members are doing uh, in service of the city. Thank you. Well it, done. It's important to me that people know how hard you all work because we do work hard. Uh, and that's, that's been published on, on the web for people that weren't at, at the uh, chamber luncheon. Excellent. Okay, and with that, um, my report, you'll, you'll, we have a,
Cascade Water Alliance meeting tomorrow. I just want to tell you that I was in a meeting today with Cascade. It was a little depressing, uh, the financial reports that are coming out with regard to just the economics of what's going on right now portend very ill well for rates. So it's, it's getting worse, not better. Um, but we'll hear more about that later. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to City Manager. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. So, uh, before I get to my report itself, we actually have a report back to you on two previous legislative request memos. Uh, the first one is going to be presented by Julie Underwood, our Public Works Director, and this is uh, in response to the Council's request to evaluate uh, Crosswalk uh, for Pride Month, a decorative crosswalk somewhere in the city. So, good, good evening, Council. I'm pleased to be here to present um, an LRM requested by Councilmember Curtis um, to install a decorative crosswalk to commemorate Pride Month in June. Um, just to give you an orientation of kind of examples out there, here are a few. You um, may have seen some of these. They're local in Seattle, and I think the first one is an example in D.C. Um, the staff has presented in the LRM a proposed location and a proposed decorate, decorative element. And so here you, you see the internationally recognized intersex inclusive progress pride flag in the middle of the intersection at Park Lane and Main Street. We propose this location due to its really low volume of vehicles, but then very active ped rollers in the area. Um, alternative locations also suggested in the LRM include Kirkland Avenue and Lakeshore Plaza, as well as Kirkland Avenue and Main Street. Additionally, the LRM included some alternative decorative elements, as, as you see here in this slide. So tonight, um, there are, I kind of categorized them into two items. Short term, um, provide staff direction on the location for the installation, as well as what decorative element you would like to see installed. There is a bit of an urgency to that one <laughs> to meet the June uh, time frame due to weather, due to purchasing requirements. Um, and then long term, um, uh, to direct us to come back with a more formal policy and program for installing decorative markings um, of crosswalks and our intersections. So with that, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Council Member Curtis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor is not letting us take a break, so I'll be <laughs> quick. <laughs> Um, so first, I want to thank staff for this analysis, and thank you to the community members who've reached out. I've received one email in opposition. Um, the fact that this is more complicated than I originally imagined shows the value of our LRM process, because of course staff knows more than I do, and so they raise important issues. Um, and like you just said, I'm glad that we did this now, because we don't have a lot of time. We need to get this done by June. And I just want to be clear with the council and the public that the reason that I raise this is to reflect our community, our goal of being a welcoming and inclusive community, and that so young people, I don't want to cry, um, who identify as gay or trans or queer, they feel seen, they feel supported, they feel welcomed, and they belong. Um, this is an act of goodwill. And um, so taking aside whether we should do it, um, what I'd like to suggest, because I, I feel strongly that we should do it, uh, my vision is that we take an existing crosswalk, and you had that uh, DC picture of painting the progress or the pride flag between our, our, our ladder style crosswalks. Um, and I appreciate the feedback on the LRM, good thinking that this shouldn't be in a high traffic area. Um, because people will want to interact with it. Um, the ones that I've seen in other cities, people are stopping and taking pictures. So I appreciate your doing alternate suggestions than a high traffic area. I think that the Park Lane um, location is not the best stop, start, stop, spot. Excuse me. Any art or enhancements that happen on Park Lane should really come out of our Park Lane study. 
um, so that we're doing a comprehensive look at that corridor and not dropping this art there. Um, the la locations that I do have in mind, having had time to think about it, is uh, Marina Park. It's a gateway to our city. It's a tourist destination. It's a beloved public amenity. It's a gathering place. It's where we have our 4th of July parade. It's where local races happen. Um, and there's a number of spots that could happen there. It could be at the entrance where the Kirkland Scramble is going to go. It could be where the flagpole is. It could be where the restroom is. There's a lot of options there. Um, I do see that there's a difference between, I think I agree that we need to talk about process. My thinking was this was a, a, an easy application that could either be permanent or ephemeral. Um, if we are talking about putting art in an intersection, I think that we need to be more thoughtful about our process. Um, it's expensive, it has public impact, should it, we have very clear guidelines with our Cultural Arts Commission on how they, we evaluate art. And so I don't want to do this outside of that process. So my suggestion is that we go back to my original suggestion, which is um, to, to do a cross, crosswalk. It could be uh, temporary, something that we can install before the June Pride Month, and then take an evaluation and take time to do a process of um, more, a more permanent installation um, for next year. So we'll have a short-term solution for this year and then have time to do this right for next year. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Nixon. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and I don't have any problem with uh, a, a, certainly a temporary thing, but uh, when we originally talked about this, um, I did ask to have a staff report on what city code, state law, and federal code, like the manual, uh, manual on uniform traffic control devices, say about this. Um, and I also would like to have a legal analysis, which if you want, we could do an executive session, if it's attorney-client privileged, um, on what liability the city might face if there was a crash and at wherever this is done and somebody were to claim that this non-standard paint contributed to their injuries or whatever. So I'd like to understand all that before we go ahead with it. If, if we can get that information, I'd appreciate it. Um, Councilmember Nixon, I talked to the transportation manager and he informed me that really it comes down to making sure that the white reflective paint is what you see at night and that is what's reflective. The paint you would not be able to see at night. So um, that was the, um, from, from his, um, understanding, talking with our traffic uh, and engineers, that was the main concern, is the paint shouldn't be reflective. Um, it should really be part of the pavement at night, and what you should see at night is that white reflective paint. That was his big concern. Um, and then there are some, I think the LRM noted, there are some recent studies that have come out that it actually might have some safety benefits. So um, I think that research is still pretty pretty new, but I I think um, I think from the staff perspective we feel um, our risks are are low if we do it right. Yeah, I read that entire Bloomberg document. I hope other council members have had an opportunity to do that, and uh, it it's not without controversy. Um, if you search online, there's there's uh, others who uh, disagree with some of the findings. But um, uh, my main concern is the liability issue. And, um, and I mean, we've, we've told people, for example, uh, that we can't do certain things about the truck eating bridge, which will be coming up next, <laughs> yes, coming. because the MUTCD says we can't. And, and so I just want to make sure that's not an issue for this as well. And I and if you like, we can definitely bring you more information or provide that to you. Um, I'm just concerned about timing on that. If but um, what I what we could do is since we proceed with this, is if we find anything in our research that says it's a problem before we actually put paint down, we could come back to the council and say we learned this. But so we could sort of do them in parallel if that works for the council. Yeah, I think if our staff objected, you would see that in the LRM for sure. But right, we will do another. Um, 
another con confirmation. We'll talk to some other agencies on that. And then um, obviously in the program that we bring before you, the policy around, as you see in the on the screen, I mean, uh, the Pine Street example, that, that one's really quite striking. Um, so that would be something we'd want to certainly talk to you more about, especially something that dramatic. But, but those Seattle guys are just off laws anyway. So, okay, thank you. Yes, Council Member Curtis. I was going to say that there are pride crosswalks in, Kirk, in Seattle. Ooh, that was weird. So we could check on um, accident rates. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Pascal. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So I just want to first off start by saying that I support the implementation of a pride crosswalk in Kirkland. The thing that I'm thinking about is I, I was really hoping that this, the location would be chosen under a guise of a, of a broader kind of pavement art program. But I recognize that, you know, there are some time constraints here. Yeah. That, when you when you when you go and you actually look at what other cities are doing in the nation around pavement art, which would include pride crosswalks and other forms of art at intersections and crosswalks. Um, you can tell that they've developed a program that has sought community input so that community members, staff, other future council members have can consider these various issues in making what I would say a, a this is this is really meant to be a permanent pavement art installation. Uh, I recognize it could be temporary, but generally these are permanent in nature uh, within the public right of way. And the issues that I've seen be dealt with in a program that's contained in an umbrella of a program is you know, considerations of maintenance costs, a criteria on identifying a location. We're already having some kind of you know, questions about what would be an appropriate location for, for a painted crosswalk, design considerations, um, whether there's situations where we should include um, the guidance and input from our Cultural Arts Commission and then just how we communicate these decisions to the greater community. Uh, I would add that the Pride Crosswalks in Seattle are under an umbrella of SDOT's Community Crosswalk Program that has these defined criteria already in place. Um, so that wasn't, you know, ad hoc. That was that was that was a, a defined program. Um, and then I have a hard time kind of. Exp explaining some of this to the community in my mind because we have some very well thought out policies around that we just adopted around banners and flags, which are temporary in nature. You put them up, you take them down. Here we're talking about a permanent art installation. So I'm kind of struggling with how I explain that to someone. Um, why, why we have these policies on for temporary things, but we haven't really developed anything for a more permanent thing. Um, so it would just make me much more comfortable to have some type of program and some guidance here and then move forward with it. Um, but I understand there's, you know, some uh, time constraint, um, but I'm, I'm open to making sure that this is well thought out, that this lasts the, the test of time and that we can think about how we broaden this beyond just this one location. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Falcone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, I fully support um, both, you know, what I'm hearing tonight and what I read in the memo for both short and long-term plans here. Um, I am a um, strong believer that public art is a great way to create a sense of belonging and to really demonstrate our values um, as a city. And I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity to do that for our youth in the community, for um, folks all throughout the community. And so I love the idea of doing this short term for this year, um, and I support you know alternative locations as Councilor McCarter suggested. I would love to see as part of the long term plan, thinking about if there are multiple locations throughout the city. We're a fairly large sized suburban city, and so I would love for folks to. There may be folks who don't spend time downtown, right? I would love for our youth to see them near their schools, for example, and near their homes throughout the community. So. I love for that as we're looking towards um, 2024. Gosh, that seem, seems so long away to say 2024. 12-year-old um, me would think that was just, I'd be ancient by then. But um, 
Anyway, so I fully support that. I also support staff suggestion in the memo to create draft policy for creating artistic cross crosswalks and intersections. Said this before, you know, I see blank canvases everywhere throughout the city. There are so many opportunities, and this is one of those opportunities. So I think that, you know, it um, improves safety, as Councilor Pascal has, has noted before. Um, as I mentioned, it's an opportunity to demonstrate our inclusive values and an opportunity for more public art, which, you know, I love, especially diverse um, public art. So I um, fully support that, and I look forward to having the discussion. Uh, I look forward to being there for, you know, to celebrate this um, new art installation or crosswalk here in Kirkland this year, but also really look forward to the long-term discussion um, specifically about preparing for Pride Month next year, but also broader, as Councilor Pascal has said, just about art in crosswalks and intersections more broadly across the city. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Arnold. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll just close by saying I'm, I think Council Member Falcone has laid it out nicely. I support moving ahead on the short term to have rainbow uh, crosswalks installed as Council Member Curtis has talked about and then tackle some of the broader issues about intersection art and involving the public, uh, involving our cultural arts commission on, on future policies. I think the reason why we're moving want to move quickly on the short term is to be able to make Pride Month, to have something in place for Pride Month. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Leck. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I won't uh, say much because it sounds like we have a consensus building. Just want to add my voice uh, to a long-term goal of a comprehensive um, uh, plan, um, a con comprehensive program, rather. Uh, but I like the idea of a short-term solution for this. I would just remind us, because we're about to talk about the truck eating bridge, that uh, we were all pretty supportive of the temporary solution for the truck eating bridge, even though we ultimately, as you know, our, the experts who advise us, you know, did have advice for us of that maybe, you know, um, certain treatments of the bridge uh, might be a problem, but it would, made sense. Uh, because other people's trucks um, are really important to us. We want to make sure they're not getting stuck on our bridge. I would just suggest somewhat lightheartedly, but actually somewhat seriously, that uh, what, a, uh, what a, a, pr a, a pride flag installation would mean uh, for June of 2023 for um, youth in the city of Kirkland is at least as important um, as people who get their U-Haul trucks stuck under our bridge. Uh, so I think a temporary solution makes sense, knowing that we are developing a more comprehensive solution, um, as we did with the bridge. Thanks. And I think what I am hearing is consensus that we want to do both. So uh, go buy the paint. May I ask? <laughs> I, paint. So may I ask that you are leave to staff to pick then the actual crosswalk or crosswalks that this, the colors will go in, so we don't need to come back to the council for that final decision. Since we're not paying an intersection itself, but we'll, based on this feedback, we'll f figure the right crosswalk. Downtown it, Marina so Park is what I'm hearing, consensus, that location. Right. Okay. Yeah, we can we do that. We want to ride on it Great. when we go okay. through the parade. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Julie, are you sta stand for the next one? Uh, this next one is actually <laughs> Diana. <laughs> okay. Diana Hart, uh, who... Uh, as is part of her group, the uh, Cultural Arts Commission is going to be speaking to the next legislative request memo. Okay. Uh, this is a short presentation on this, and this was the second one, which asked about uh, replacing the banners eventually with a mural. Um, just so, welcome, Diana. Thank you, Council. Um, we have, of course, the Truck Eating Bridge banner, which is now an official city banner. Um, council has requested information about the process for turning the banner into a mural at the same location. Um, one of the first considerations I want to flag for our council is the timeline, looking at the schedule for the call to artists for the Northeast 68th Street underpass mural along the CKC. The call to artists went out in mid-January and had art installation completing in May. Working back from the ideal less rainy weather season to successfully install the mural, rapidly getting, we're rapidly getting close to missing the window to competently install this year. So if council wants to move forward with the mural, we would work quickly to get this item in front of the KCAC by their April meeting with a near immediate RFP issuance to have installation wrapping up in September. 
It is possible that this timeline might be too tight with other work items and that might delay installation till spring of next year. Um, some other considerations um, that council should consider is um, that we'll, we would con um, coordinate with artists, the KCAC, the original banner, banner creators in the neighborhood to identify an appropriate design that captures the essence of the banner. There is currently no identified funding source. Um, the 68th Street underpass mural project had about a $10,000 price tag. And um, installation may require potential or partial closure of the area to safely install the mural. Um, I just wanted to flag that for you as well. Um, the three alternative options that we included in the LRM is to keep the banner as is, pursue alternative traditional paint murals, which may delay the timeline or impact costs, but could increase access to alternative art styles, and then whether to utilize artist interpretation of the banner or to keep the current design. And then um, Jim and I are available if you have any questions. Thank you, Councilmember Curtis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, like Councilmember Falcone, I love public art. <laughs> so I am also looking at blank canvases. Um, this LRM was requested in recognition that the community keeps asking us, why don't we paint the bridge? Um, they do it through venues, they do it through social media. Um, now that the banner is saved, and, and, I, and I'm gonna take, Council Member Falcone did a very good job of her last LRM being very specific about what she's asking and I am taking notes. So the banner is saved. I don't see any urgency to this project. Um, I think, see value to the project in that there's opportunities from our art, it could improve traffic safety, and it's an opportunity to engage with our well-loved truck eating bridge. So my thinking was to give this to the Cultural Arts Commission as an opportunity to work with the stakeholders and design an appropriate mural. I was not, my intent was not to suggest that we replicate the shark banner. Um, the Cultural Arts Commission may decide that there's an other more interesting, sorry folks for the shark banner. I love the shark banner, but there might be an other way to do this. So I also do not want to impact the Cultural Arts Commission work plan. I know that they have a lot of projects on their list. So my question is more, is this something the council's interested in exploring? Can we give it to the Cultural Arts Commission and Jim and Martha and you to say, how does this fit in the work plan? And then go from there, not, oh my gosh, we need to do this in the next six months. So that's where I am on this project. Okay, Council Member Nixon. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. And I, I agree with Council Member Curtis. I, I, I don't see an urgency. Um, I mean, the nice thing about the banner is whatever we do, the banner could stay, yeah. <laughs> but, but that's a separate issue, right? Um, I, I did want to take the opportunity to mention that, uh, fingers crossed, as of March 5th, it will have been a full year since there was a crash into the bridge that was recorded. There's always those crashes that happen in the middle of the night and nobody knows about it and they drive away, right? But as far as we know, it will have been a year as of March 5th, and there's actually a celebration planned. Um, so uh, Angela is, is working on that. Uh, it's scheduled... Last time I saw on Facebook was 1 to 3 p.m. on Sunday the 5th. And I volunteered to bring plates and napkins, and she's going to bring cake. So um, uh, just it, it, like I said, it's, it's hard to know whether we should advertise it because that would jinx it and we'd actually have a crash. <laughs> but hopefully not. Um, but, but, but anyway, the main thing is I, I agree with doing it through the normal deliberative process and not trying to rush it all in one year. Thank you. Councilmember Black. And thank you, Madam Mayor. So um, big supporter of this. Um, as I love public art too, <laughs> much as everyone. But you know what else I like? I also like history. So I would just, I, I love the idea of handing this off to the Cultural Arts Commission and having them come up with something that could be uh, compliment the banner, um, riff off of the banner, or be super creative in some way. I actually, there is a small place in my heart for the Northern Pacific logo and livery. Yeah. Um, and the fact that this was a Northern Pacific line, I got railroaders in my family, um, and I just frankly like history, and Kirkland does have 
a nice history of the railroad. I would just, if we could mention to the, the Cultural Arts Commission that if there's an idea that they have where they can preserve the Northern Pacific logo and livery, I think that would be great. Super. Uh, Councilmember Falcone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, first, thank you to the community on this. Like, I love, I think I mentioned that the night we were talking about this, I love when there's something that the community cares about and you bring it forth to council and we try to find a solution. It's really fun and, I mean, the, the, the banner is fun. The community engagement around it is fun. Um, we, um, it's po possibly helping with safety as well and it's getting people talking about safety. So I think that's a good thing. Um, I support what I'm hearing so far. I came in here tonight thinking I would support options two or three um, and wanting to give the Cultural Arts Commission again and the community an opportunity to be creative here and provide input um, and not have their hands tied necessarily to that banner design, although I do also really enjoy that banner design. I think it's fun and funny. Um, and, and, you know, that may include, the options may include the current design or an interpretation of that current design. Um, I also don't see a sense of urgency here. I don't have a good sense of how long like a banner will last, but it's lasted for a while, right? Didn't someone take it, take one at some point and then run, another one was printed. But aside from that, like it, they're pretty durable. So um, I don't feel a sense of urgency here. Um, funding source was mentioned. So just wanted to say to please uh, find a funding source other than the diverse art funding source for this, unless there's gonna be something um, really great to promote, promote um, some um, sense of diversity with it, other than being a truck eating bridge, then that would be really cool. Because um, again, it could be a blank canvas for anything, but if it is in the nature of being the truck eating bridge, then I ask that we not use the funding that's been set aside for that. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, most of the time, council is loath to actually weigh in on art. That's why we have a cultural arts commission. I think what's different here is we're talking about some uh, set of functions here. And the, the, the banner has been effective, as Councilmember Nixon has mentioned. So I'm in support of option three, that, that we're providing some direction to say we want an interpretation of that banner, because I think that banner's design, its humor, and uh, has caught enough attention uh, with with the shark design and the truck eating bridge message that I think that needs to be maintained. I support Councilmember Black's uh, comment to say uh, incorporating the railroad history would be a second ask, but uh, a secondary ask, but secondary because I think we are talking about uh, the the function here. So I think it's a little bit different. This is not just a public art project saying we'd like to paint the bridge. We're trying to have some function there, and I'm hoping that that message gets through to the uh, commission as they're going through this process. I would agree with what we've said with, with my colleagues. We want to do the process right. We can keep the banner until uh, the commission goes through their normal, uh, normal process and deliberation and prioritization. Thank you. Thank you. Phew. We've spent a lot of time on LRMs tonight. <laughs> um, I agree with with generally what I'm hearing. So, um, so let's, let's be cool and move forward. If the, uh, I think the conversation will be a fun one with the Cultural Arts Committee. Uh, so with that, back to you for calendar. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, just two other quick updates. Uh, one is we had hoped tonight to have the draft letter of intent for the purchase of the park and ride uh, for the council to review. Um, I heard from WashDOT uh, later this afternoon that they don't quite have that ready. They hope to have it from the Attorney General tomorrow. And so as soon as I have that, I'll, I'll report to the council on that because obviously we obviously want to proceed with purchasing the parking right. Um, the second thing I wanted to give council an update on is that tomorrow the uh, racer board will be interviewing four finalists for the executive director position. We have four, we think, pretty outstanding um, candidates, um, but we did have a meeting with the navigators and the Kirkland community responders and the uh, current community advisory board of lived experience folks that met all four candidates and gave us a lot of really thoughtful feedback and some insights and some things to ask. So I uh, just want to let you know that I'm not not totally sure how tomorrow's going to go, but uh, I think that the board is definitely going to be focusing on taking the time it needs to get it right and, and doing some thorough looks into some of these issues. So. We had been trying to be on a fairly quick timeline because we know we want to get this up and running. 
uh, we still may be able to do make a decision. It might become super clear tomorrow, but we do have a lot of great candidates who each have different strengths. So, but uh, the board is going to be doing it very thoughtfully, and we'll keep you updated. But I'm excited about uh, as we keep moving down this path to create this agency. So, so with that, I am done with my report. And any calendar updates or changes from the council? Nothing hap ever happens to me. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right, and then just a reminder, we do have a, a executive session to discuss pending litigation, but we'll probably want to take a short break in between now and then. Great. So uh, how long do you think this can take? Uh, there's, there's two topics. I'm going to guess not more than 20 minutes for both topics together, okay. and it might be less. But So we will probably adjourn at 1020. Do I need to come back, or will we just adjourn in the room? Just for process, just for process of adjournment, I'm just looking at the time, Mayor. Um, my oh. computer says ten. Do we need to do a second offer of items from the audience? Oh, nope. It's so after ten. So ten okay. minutes and thirty seconds. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Thank you for stalling us like that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Perhaps we had five minutes for a break, so make it 10.25, adjourning from the okay. executive session. Great. Mayor, could you um, mention that we're going to return only for the purposes of adjournment? Yes, I could do that. Thank you. You could have done it right there. Um, so we are going to adjourn at 10.25, and we will return only for the purpose of adjournment.